So one of the first things that we get into when we start looking at OSPF is, well, you know, we can look at OSPF and say, oh my God, there's a lot of areas there. Or we can start to break things down step by step, which is really the better way to go about doing this stuff. So the first area that we're going to get into here as far as an exercise has to do specifically with frame relay. So we're going to be looking at a diagram for area 0 and area 24 in particular. So those four routers consisting of the frame relay network area. Now, I haven't really spelled out a whole lot of uh, requirements or anything like that, so let's kind of stick with some of the basic configurations or the basic issues that we may end up running into here. Okay, so the, the easiest, well, I shouldn't say the easiest, the first and most straightforward one is going to be our point-to-point -point link or our, our link between uh, router 2 and router 4 there, what we're designating as area 24. So let's kind of take a look at that to begin with. So as we get into router 2, so if we do show run section 010, so that's the serial interface there, we'll get our different configurations and see what we have. So essentially I'm looking at the 150.124 network. Now, router OSPF1, network 150.100.24.2, into area 24. Uh, should be plain and simple. All right, just get our config right there, same type of thing. Router OSPF 1. Okay, so it should be pretty good, right? let's take a look at our adjacency here or what do we see going on I'm going to do this on both sides just so we get some variety as you will so as we start to look at this or as we start to see anything or see not anything happening here this may cause some concern or some issues I suppose part of it's going to depend on how long we wait and we really have two sets of timers in OSPF we either have the fast timers, which sends hellos every 10 seconds, and then a dead time of 40 seconds. Or we have the slower timers, which is sending a hello every 30 seconds and a dead time of 120. So either way we look at stuff, by default here, I should be getting into an idea that I at least see something within a 30 second period of time. And the question is, do I? I mean, let's test just for giggles and see whether it's really working or not. Okay, so we have reachability, so this is a good thing. So we know that we have layer 2 reachability here, which, by the way, very important piece of troubleshooting. As long as we've validated that during the layer 2 section, we at least have one less thing to worry about when we're looking at OSPF. But still, I'm looking at stuff here on router 2 and on router 4, and I'm seeing absolutely nothing. So what's up with that? So let's see. Do show IP OSPF interface. All right, so we have one link, serial 010.24, point to point. Okay, so every 10 seconds I should be seeing, it. well, I suppose in, in this debug we won't see a hello, but I should see some sort of exchange when I get both sides. So, all right, so every 10 seconds I'm sending something out. On the other side. Oh, well, that's going to be part of my issue right there. Okay, and by the way, the others are our wait time, and we just elected ourselves the DR. So when we start looking at these things, this is part of an issue. On a point-to-point -point link was really just one side's reference point there. The other side was the default of non-broadcast. So what do we do? How do we fix it? Well, let's take a look first at our show run. So I have the broadcast keyword enabled. This is good. So one of the things that we can do... Go to my interface here, and I can say IPOSPF network point to point. So now exactly what's going to happen here is I'm going to basically stop that DR stuff, and I'm going to change it to a point to point. So I don't have any DR election, and poof, magically it works. Every 10 seconds, see everything in there, all my stuff is set, and we are good to go. Uh, so this is a good thing. So now I should be able to check my OSPF neighbors. 
and see that I'm exchanging full sets of information there. Now, of course, I'm not going to have any routes yet because I really haven't added any other pieces of information. Let's kind of take a look at my diagram, I guess, for R4. And yeah, it doesn't show very much there. It doesn't tell me anything about my loopback. So let's go ahead and add the loopback into Area 24 just so we at least get something and can, you know, feel good about it sort of idea. So router OSPF1 network 200.0.0.4. All right. So now at this point in time, built the LSA for it. So I go over to router 2. And look at my OSPF routes, and I've got it there. So that part's good to go. That's at least one nice thing. So as we start looking at these pieces now, the next step to get into is going to be our multi-point frame relay. Now, as we do start getting into this, okay, so look, taking a look at where we're at right here, that's the 150, 100, 100 network. So 2, 5, and 6. Now, a multi-point sub-interface as well as a physical interface will both default to non-broadcast. So we're at least going to be consistent in terms of our network types here. All right, so that's going to be one piece. So let's take a look at, well, I guess kind of running into our configuration here. So this is going to be my area zero config. I can pretty much copy this for 5 and 6 there, and the only thing I'm going to need to change is the IP address. Now this is if I decide to use the all zeros mask. If I was doing it with a slash 24 mask, honestly I wouldn't even have to do this part right here. I just put the same thing in every single one of them. Uh, but, you know, whatever. One step at a time, not the end of the world. So let's see, we got R2, paste that. Got R5, paste that, and I got R6, and paste that. Now, show IP OSPF interface on here. That's going to be non broadcast. That's going to be non broadcast. And serial 010.256, that's going to be non broadcast. So that's kind of the good part. We have that portion running. Let me go ahead and do debugs down here too. Um, so we'll go ahead and get all that stuff turned down and we should be ready to go. So nothing's going to happen yet though because remember in the non-broadcast arena you must have a neighbor command. Uh, so oh yeah let's go ahead and put our loopbacks in here as well. Didn't think about doing that. We're still in the router, so network 200.0.0.6. I put that in there. I put that in there. Oh, we already got R4s in. We don't want to do R4 again. So we should be good to go at this point. Once we get stuff up and running, or once we get our neighbor commands in here, we should end up having routes. Now, neighbor command doesn't make a difference. We can put it on the hub, we can put it on the spokes, we can put it on both of them if you feel like it, but it's really only necessary on one side. So let's do it up here on the hub, so that way we at least have one full set there. Notice, by the way, that after a while it does tell me no full neighbors to build net LSA. So basically, I can't form a neighbor relationship yet. So take a look at neighbor 150.100.5 and 6. All right. So we got two neighbors on there. We're starting the address. We're starting the unicast conversation with them. If I go over to 5 and 6, now I should see that we're starting to receive some packets. Um, now notice one kind of thing up here once this start stop stops. Um, we're receiving some bizarre packets here receive packets with a mismatch area in header now why would i be receiving that 
I should not be receiving that information. If I look at my diagram over here, there is no way that R4 should be talking to R5 or R6. Does R6 have that same information? No, it doesn't appear to have a problem with it. No, nope, scrolling up, there's no issue there. So we can discover a lot of things as far as our debugs happen to go. All right, so let's take a look at that. So on R4, why am I getting that information? Ah, that might have something to do with it there. All right, so R4 has a dynamic entry over on the side. Hmm. That's not supposed to be happening over to R5. There must have been something involved. Let's well, see, I've got one to R4. I've got a dynamic entry to R6 also. Huh. Well, let's take a look over at R6. I've got a dynamic entry there too. This can cause us some problems. All right, well, it's not causing us a problem so far. If we had gotten into an idea where, well, let's just go ahead and configure it on here. Um, where if we thought we were supposed to have a full mesh of peers going on. So non-broadcast is kind of helping me decide for my hub and spoke type network here. But if I decided I was going to have a full mesh happening. We may end up incurring some um, difficulties. We'll kind of leave it that way. So as we start going in here, notice that I am getting different neighbor relationships being built. In a hub and spoke network, we should not be getting neighbor relationships. If I were running a broadcast or a um, point to multipoint network, I would end up running into the same thing here where I would have peering between my spokes. In a hub and spoke network, so let's go back to our drawing over here, where we start looking at things for where we're going to be at, where R2 is the hub, R5 and 6 are merely peered up to it, I should not be seeing direct spoke to spoke communication. Because with a TTL of 1 in the routing packets, well, it's kind of not going to happen there. So we have some issues with the dynamic routing portion. Let's see a do show run interface zero zero one zero real quick. And oh yeah, you know, one big thing I don't have in there is turning off inverse ARP. So that's why I have that discovery, that dynamic mapping in there. So we do have to be careful about these things to make sure that it doesn't happen, unless of course we intend it to happen. 90% of the time, I'd probably venture to say that we're not going to intend that to happen. All right, so that's one thing we're going to need to look at there, is to go into interface 0010, no frame inverse ARP. Uh, take a look at our OSPF config there. Let's go ahead and get rid of that neighbor. Because we're really not supposed to have spoke-to-spoke -spoke communication anyway. Right. So that went ahead and killed it, and that part's nice. And we'll get rid of our dynamic mapping, and we'll kind of kind of go with that part there. All right, so let's take a look over here also. Right, yeah, same type of idea. And most likely on R4, going to be the same issue. Yep. So little things that we do in previous steps, such as forgetting to do my inverse ARP or not paying attention to it one way or the other, maybe the lab didn't say anything for me, so I thought the inverse ARP was kind of a cool idea to go, but notice in here, especially between the 4 and the 5 or whatever, we can have some really serious issues in terms of the reachability or at least the sheer number of debugs and error messages that we're getting. And remember, all these things not only, you know, bog down the router, but it also irritates us when we have to go do show commands or debugs and look at stuff. So you might not want that to happen as you go through. Now, as we start looking at this in here, so do show frame map, we're going to still have those dynamic entries. Uh, 
All right. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we can do that clear frame in our command and they'll actually go away. So let's you know keep that in mind. Uh, show frame map. Do clear frame interp. All right, went away there too. Don't always count on that command working because it's had a, uh, oh, let's just call it a horrible track record over time in terms of whether it works or not. Now, reloading a router is most certainly your 100% effective way of getting rid of your dynamically learned maps. But in the meantime, try that command out, that clear command, see what happens in there, and, you know, go for it that way. So hopefully things are still good in here. Do show IP OSPF neighbor. Okay, now it's still showing me as connected with 5 right there. So 6 to 5 are peering. And it's still showing that on that side, which may cause some issues in there. Okay. And on that side, things are the way that we expect it to be. Right. Now, one of the next pieces, so let's kind of look at our stuff and, and go ahead and paste this on all of your routers there. Do show IP route OSPF. Okay, so I've got my loopbacks over there. So that part's pretty cool. So R4. Okay, got two, five, and six, and the other network. Okay. Do four and six. All right, so that's good. All right, so it looks like I got reachability as far as that goes. So do ping 200.002. Whoops. Two. Source loop x0. And ping that. Four. Okay, I just lost my neighbor to five. All right. So ping number four. That works. And the question is, can I ping number five? And I can't ping number five now. So I lost my neighbor, I guess, after all that other information going away and kind of dying at that point. So, I mean, on the bright side, my neighbor relationship is kind of what I expect to see now. But on the other side, it makes it kind of difficult because I'm not getting reachability. So why... Well, there's an even bigger problem. I don't have any OSPF routes whatsoever, but I do have one neighbor. I'm peered to R2. Okay, and he's got routes to 2 and 4. I can still ping that, so that's good. To be able to ping this too. Yep, so that's not a problem on there. Two. And I still don't have information with five. But I have a neighbor relationship there. So the next problem area that we tend to run into with our frame relay stuff is, well, plain and simple, reachability. And so that's kind of an interesting one right there. Now, reachability takes on a couple different meanings. First meaning can very well be that we don't have reachability to the next hop address. All right. So show frame map, I have reachability right there to 100.5. So there's my peering address. That's the information. I should be good to go from R2. But yet I don't see any of the LSAs there being advertised. All right. So let's kind of look at it a different way. Do show IP OSPF interfaces include is up and state so we're going to see a couple different things here uh, first of all i mean the show, the whole command of show ipospf interface is good but you only want a few lines out of it so try not to you know waste your time hunting through things going okay i know this was the command where is that part that i need if you recognize the part that you need, use the grep commands to help you out. That's kind of the cool way to go about doing things. So as we look at this, 
So we're seeing that our interfaces are up. That's all nice. But I'm looking for the state. State point to point is all cool for 0, uh, 0 and 0.24. But 0 and 0.256, state BDR, backup designated router. All right. So let's kind of highlight this command here. Copy that. And we're going to paste it into our other routers. See if we can see what's up with that. So R5 says it's DR other. But on the other hand, this, the show IPOSV of neighbor command, tells me that it believes that R2, its peer, is the DR. R6, on the other hand, says it's the DR. And that R2 is the BDR. So R2 believes that, yes, it is the BDR, but up here it says that 6 is the DR and 5 is DR other. So we have some issues in that. Right? So when somebody is the DR, they are the ones who have the right to announce routes. A BDR, well, basically just sits there for most of the time. It'll announce routes if the DR happens to go away. Other dilemma or problem with this is that a designated router or a backup designated router is supposed to form a peering relationship with every device on the network. Now, R5 is no longer connected with R6. So if R6 is the designated router, we have some issues going on. So that part's not going to work in there. Uh, there's nothing for us to do or nothing for us to see as far as that goes. So, hmm. So let's take things a step further. And okay, let's kind of have a little bit of fun with it as we go. So taking a look at where we happen to be at now, so waiting for things to kind of jive a little bit and reset for us, let's see where things happen to be, taking a look at our is up in state. Okay. So R6 being the DR, we've got some little problem areas bringing in here. We already talked about that part. What I want to start taking a look at, though, is our neighbor relationships or how we're going to be setting things up in there. Okay, so... 2 is going to be my BDR, so that's all pretty cool. Now, one of the things, and I want to keep in mind with a little bit of a lesson here, we need to change stuff around to make sure that R2 is the DR. Right now, he's BDR, so that's going to be part of our problem here. So let's kind of go along the lines of putting some requirements into our lab for this. So let's see. I mean, we can take some easy ways. We could always do IPOSPF priority 0 on the spokes, but... Yay, where's the fun in that, you know? Um, we could set a higher priority on the hub. Okay, again, where's the fun in that? So when we start looking at things, let's say that our requirements are we are not allowed to use the IPOSPF priority command on any routers. We are not allowed to use the router ID command on our spoke routers. And we must assure that the hub router really is the DR. So as we go through and kind of look at that, I mean, the, the priority command, you know, like I said, makes things pretty easy, but it also kind of messes with our heads a little bit. Now, I can't use the router ID command on the spokes. It doesn't say anything about using the router ID command on the hub, so I could very well do that. Now, we have another problem, however. Take a look at the neighbor IDs. This is the router ID of our neighbors right there. So... We had a loopback added onto R6 there that um, kind of set 223, 255, 255, 255 as my router ID. Well, I mean, not that big of a deal. Remember, we would choose router IDs by the highest IP address, or if there's a loopback, we use the loopback, or if there's more than one loopback, we use the highest IP address loopbacks. Okay? So the question is, can we get a higher number than that? All right, well, let's kind of take a, take a look at it. So interface L01 IP address. Well, we got to go higher than that one. So 224.001, whatever. Nope, got to put mask. Nope, that's not a valid host address. What about those class E things? Maybe we can do it with a 240 address on there. Nope, that's not a valid one either. Oh. 255. No, nope, can't do that. 
So the problem is we can't add an IP address that is higher than what R6 has. Hmm. So what can we do to make that happen? Well, now I didn't say that I couldn't use the router ID. So let's go in here, router OSPF, and say router ID, question mark. Hmm. OSPF router ID in an IP address format. Doesn't tell me much of anything about how that format happens to go. Huh. Well, it happens to take that. And that's a very important lesson there. The router ID, even though we pull it from IP addresses, is not an IP address. It's actually just a 32-bit number. So 224.0.0.1, while I can't add that onto an interface, I can use it perfectly fine as an OSPF process. Okay, so clear my OSPF process there. I'm gonna change everything out. Just show IP OSPF just to make sure. And there we go, we see that our router ID has changed. All right, so that's kind of a good thing up there. So as we start forming our peers again here, we should see everything going well. So let's see, let me go back down here so we can paste to all stuff. Yeah, I know you can't do that in the lab, but I really like doing that. <laughs> okay, so we're still in a waiting state. Okay? So at this point in time, I haven't finished with my peers on that multi-point frame relay. Um, my peer in the point-to-point -point one just is just fine. But as we come up here, and we'll, we should see the neighbors hopefully come up here pretty quick. Um, yeah, another one of those things that may take a minute or so. So you got to love the world of frame relay. But as we're going through here, we should at least be able to see that at this point in time, we will know that our hub is indeed going to be the DR. Right, let's go make sure real quick here on R2 that we didn't kill our neighbor statements. Okay, so neighbor statements are all there, and that part's good. And I can ping them. I got reachability. Okay, so we're cool on that. So it'll just take a minute or so for OSPF to come up, and, you know, we love when that happens. So let's take a little break for that. Okay, so there we go. We saw those guys pop in there finally, so we should be able to take a look and see where we're at. Check out my state, and somehow I'm still coming up as the BDR on 256. Now, why in the world would that have happened? So when we go back and look at things, well, now that's going to be part of the issue there. Whenever you're doing a clearing of process, you got to kind of keep in mind that, especially in the, the DR BDR relationship, the whole object of the DR and BDR is that if the designated router goes away, the backup will take over. Well, you know, if R5 or R6 or anything before had changed its behavior for what it was, then, yeah, we kind of have some issues. We have even more issues in this case because both R5 and R6 think that they are the DR. Hmm. Yeah, that's really not going to help me either. <laughs> So we're kind of back to the idea that if I look at this, so if I go on here and let's say do show IP OSPF neighbors, take a look at everybody. I see R2 has this router ID, 224.0.0.1. I, I see that. So that's all good. Uh, oops, that's R4. On R2, I see that, well, you know, 5 has what I expect and 6 has what I expect and I should still be highest but things are still going to be messed up. In fact, you know, I still don't have anything from 5. Surprisingly, I do have stuff from 6, but things are just a little odd in that respect. If I go to 5, I have no OSPF routes. If I go to 6, I only have a couple OSPF routes there. So weird behaviors for it. Well, basically, when you're going to clear the IPOSPF process, you probably want to do it at least on all the routers in the frame cloud. We'll just go ahead and do it to all of them since we only have four configured anyway. And basically let everything start over from scratch. 
And, you know, like I said, this really becomes a matter of your backups and the order that you happen to do things in. But that can be one of those frustrating behaviors, thinking you've been through the proper steps and it's still not working properly on there. Now, a lot of people, when we go through troubleshooting, will sit there and pull out things that they've done and basically yank out the configuration, put stuff back in, try to redo it over and over and over again. And if they were concentrating on the hub, that wouldn't have done anything to reset the spokes. I mean, even though we didn't change anything on the spokes, that's actually where the problem occurred as far as how our resets go. So that's going to be kind of our difference or our difficult lesson to learn in terms of troubleshooting the OSPF frame relay stuff as we're going through here. So let's click back over to our hub and see what we have for our OSPF neighbors. Okay, so we're still attempting in terms of our serial interface, so we haven't got anything quite going yet. Uh, so that's going to be one of those timing issue things as we go. So let's wait here for a second and see what happens. Okay, so we saw stuff come up there from our five and our six neighbors. We should all be good for that part. Now, let's take a look at that state part again, now that we've cleared everybody out. And there we go. Now we see on R2 that state is the DR. In R5, well, R5 having to pick up BDR. Okay, R6 also thinks it's the BDR. So in reality, things can be a little bit more difficult as far as that goes, but at least the DR is in the right place. So we're doing okay as far as that whole election process goes. So now, let's see. Do show IP route OSPF. And I'm going to see on R6, I got 2, 4, and 5. This is good. I got two, four, and six over on R5. Yeah, R4's got everybody, and R2's got everybody. So the main thing here now, I see all my routes. Do I have ping ability? So do ping. Okay, so I certainly got it to R2. I expect that part. Have it over to R4. I expect that part. Do I have it to R5? And I do not. Why do we not have reachability to R5 even though we see the routes? So this is the next entertaining lesson that we get to have. So since we're doing stuff in here, well, yeah, I guess it can be kind of obnoxious. Let's go ahead and make an access list. Uh, so just for the ICMP stuff right here. Now the reason we're going to do that is because we're going to do a debug IP packet 101 detail. So I only want to do debugs for ICMPs. Basically I don't want to see my OSPF or any of the other crap that I have going on there. So let's say I want to go do that ping once more. And I got a route to it so why is it not sending it out? Routed via rib, sending it, encapsulation failed. Now, why, if I route it, if I have it in the routing table, why would I see an encapsulation failed message? Now, this is another one of those things with frame relay to kind of keep in mind for stuff. So, do a show IP route here and take a look at how things appear. So, namely, this line right here 200.0.0.5. That's R5's loopback address. Reachable via. 150.100.100.5. All right, so that seems fairly straightforward. Question is, can I reach it? And the answer is no. So now we're more close to the answer to the question here. Why is it that I can't ping something on a locally connected subnet? Quite simply, I don't have a map for it. I'm a multipoint interface, or a physical interface in this case. I must have a map for everything, whether dynamic or statically learned. So there's going to be our reachability problem at that point. Now, didn't we start out with the fact that I had a map to R6, and that was causing me some OSPF issues along the way, and that's why we got rid of that? So how is adding the map back in going to fix anything? Hmm? Well, plain and simple. We're going to add the map back in to the Delsi going up to R2. So we're only going to have one PVC, but we'll have multiple maps there. Uh, so let's say interface serial 010 
frame map IP 150 100.100.5 goes to 602. Now you do not need to have the broadcast parameter on here. One broadcast parameter per DLC. We talked about that earlier in frame relay. If you have it, it's not going to kill you, but don't get in that habit as far as real life goes. So now, can I ping that address? Hmm. It appears to still not be working, but on the other hand, I am not getting encapsulation failed. Okay. So what's the next step? How about we look over at R5? Since we've already been through part of the troubleshooting, we at least know where we might want to go look at. And sure enough, R5 does not have a map to get back to R6. So we'll do the same type of thing over there, a different Delcy anyway. So let's go back to R6 now. Boom. And we appear to have reachability at that point. So success rates, there we go, 100% success rate. That is some nice stuff. So do on all, take our debugging off, do ping 200.005. And that works too. So now that we fix our layer 2 reachability, we have no problems whatsoever. We will not peer OSPF, even if I put a neighbor command in, even if I change to broadcast or point to multipoint or whatever. I will not peer with the other spoke because I'm going to the same PVC and because the stuff has a TTL of 1. So that won't give me any difficulties whatsoever. But at this point in time, I have full reachability. I can do it between spokes. I can do it out of my area. And life is pretty damn good. Exactly what I expect it to be. And that's the way we like it. So that's going to be concluding our first exercise here, a lengthy one, but our first exercise covering OSPF and frame relay, as well as some router ID information. So our next area to look at in terms of OSPF operations is the methodology of authentication. So when we look at authentication, we've already been through the stuff in the theory. We have two different methods that we can do. We can do message digest based authentication, or we can do plain text based authentication. So on a couple of things we've done so far, we're going to concentrate on area 0 and area 24 for the moment. Now when we start to look at this, what I want to do for area 24 is I want to do plain text authentication, and we'll go ahead and use default passwords to Cisco just to kind of keep stuff nice in there, but plain text authentication for area 24, and then we'll do message digest authentication for area 0. Okay? So we have different methods as far as the application of that technology as well. So we've talked about using the area-based command to enable it or the interface-based command. Question always is, does it make a difference which one we choose? Well, so let's kind of take a look at it. Uh, so let's go as far as router 2 here and make sure we have our OSPF section already set up so far. So section OSPF, yep, looks pretty good. Got area 24, got area 0. Okay, so inside router OSPF 1, we might have already been there, but better safe than sorry. Uh, so taking a look at area 24 and question mark gives me an idea of the different things that we can do in here or see how the operation is going to be going. So authentication is what I want to end up with. Uh, now if I just hit enter here, that's going to be using plain text authentication. Okay, so that's our enabler at that point in time. Now, if I just leave it at this in about 40 seconds or so, because if I remember right, those were point to point. All right, yeah, so those were point to point. So in about 40 seconds or so here, we should actually see the neighbor go down because I don't have any information on it. But in this case, we're going to also go into the interface itself, and here's where I'm going to set up the authentication key. So IP OSPF, and what do we have? Well, we can enable authentication, or more importantly, we have the authentication key, so the password that I'm going to happen to use in here. Okay, so there's the neighbor going down, because we enabled authentication, even though we have no information about it, but we enabled that stuff there. So let's just do a quick show command real quick. Okay, oh, actually, we did right up above. It did say that. I noticed the simple password authentication enabled. Even with no information, we're still thinking that we're looking for it there. So 
file IP USPF authentication key all we got to do is type the word there or seven if I'm gonna give it a pre-encrypted information uh, so Cisco is perfectly cool make sure by the way if you're gonna do a space question mark at the end that you do not just hit enter there because that space then would become part of your password uh, so right now I have Cisco on the one side as far as enabling it from an area standpoint uh, but putting the key on the interface which is where it has to go so let's go over to R4 now and I want to do both of them on the interface and okay, we're starting to get mismatches here and by the way this is not a normal notification message that comes up this is something that's because we have debug running still right, so I get the adjacency events on so that's why I see that so if you leave adjacency events on all the time it'll at least be a better indicator for you as you're adding extra things and going along for troubleshooting but otherwise you might not see any information you might simply see the neighbor disappear and not necessarily know how to get it back so let's go into our serial interface right there IPOSPF authentication IPOSPF oh, authentication key Cisco enter okay. So right there, as soon as I enabled the authentication, we didn't get the mismatch authentication type anymore. Okay, what we got was a mismatch authentication key. And then once we keyed that in, then we start getting the neighbor coming back and everything should be perfectly cool. So looking at our neighbors, we're back to having our information. Looking at our routes, we're back to having our routes. So everything is perfectly cool now. Now what we did is we enabled authentication on one side just using the interface commands. Right, so we'll see the information on here up top above the router OSPF1 portion. Those are going to be interface based commands. On R2 on the other hand, I have simply the key on the interface, but I've enabled the authentication within the area itself. So basically, the bottom line is it really makes no difference where you do the enabling as long as you do it and as long as you match and as long as your keys match. Then we're doing pretty good then. Okay. So next thing we wanted to look at was area zero. So go back to our graphic real quick. Area zero is the sub-interface on R2 plus the physical interface on R5 and R6. Right. Well, so let's kind of make an easy one in here. So let's say R2, R5, R6 router OSPF1 and area zero message or authentication message digest. And so it should be good enough in a shortcut commands. So copy those commands over and we're gonna go paste that on R2. Paste, R5, paste, and R6, paste. Now, if I do this, take a look at the information here. What we're going to find as we have things set up, message digest authentication is enabled on here. Now, the question is, am I going to lose my peers? Okay. I mean, we do have a, a part on here where it specifically tells us no key configured. Now, actually, the answer is no, you're not going to lose your peers. If we're told, of course, that all passwords are Cisco, which is most likely going to be what our requirement is, and all we do is enable the Area Zero Authentication Message Digest, our neighbors will not die. Right, we are still actually doing the authentication. When in doubt, remove batteries from the telephone. In any event, where we were at, as far as the no-key configured part, Message Digest for MD5 authentication does allow the use of a null or empty password. That's what key zero is. So the fact that we've been waiting for a while, and by the way, the recording was off for probably about a minute while I tried to figure out how to kill the volume on that thing. But in any event, concept in here being that we're not going to lose our neighbors because of any Message Digest problem there. Since we pasted the configuration on there, we didn't see any mismatch in authentication types and according to our rules, everybody is sharing the same information. So what we need to do is make sure that we go back onto our interfaces now and actually define that information. Now, when we get through, keep something in mind here real quick. So on R6, we just got a physical interface. 
to show run int zero zero one zero. That's going to be our setup for that. So let's go into that interface. IP OSPF question mark. Now, if we start looking at things and say, oh, look, we're going to do the authentication key. Cisco and hit enter. Now you take a look at our interface. We haven't changed anything. So that's very important to know that also because a lot of people when we start looking at the question mark at the output there the first thing that we scroll across is authentication key and think that that sounds pretty important as far as that goes and don't tend to look any further. So if we do that when we get down to here and we see still it says no key configured using default key ID 0. Older versions of iOS did not give you this part right here. So all it said was using key zero, which you kind of look at and say, okay, whatever. I didn't have to type in a key number, so I didn't care. You're not going to get points for it. Okay? So you entered the wrong command for it. Even though it'll show up, it'll stay there perfectly fine. We're not doing clear text authentication. We're doing message digest authentication. So what we need to have is the message digest key. Okay? So let's kind of look back at our uh, pasting here interface 0010 and now we're going to do an IP OSPF message digest key 1MD5 Cisco uh, and basically we can do the same thing when we get down to R2 except it's going to be on 256 All right, so that'll be our difference at that point in time so we can paste this here I can paste it on here and when we get to R2 we might start seeing some mismatch problems and we'll see if that happens to come in actually I think it'll kill the uh, uh, the peers before we get any of those errors but let's go ahead and copy this and at least get ready for it and okay, so we see that we're still using key 0 there when I get to R5 I'm actually using key one at that point in time. So I have the information there. So, oh yeah, this is gonna take a while longer. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, it's 120 seconds. Don't feel like waiting. We'll go ahead and paste that in there. Should all be good. All right. So if you want to during your own lab, um, you're more than welcome to do that. I don't know as I'd recommend that though. Keep in mind that you have 480 minutes. So if you're going to wait two of them for it to die just so you can see it come back, that's one 240th of your whole lab experience. I'm not sure I'd waste that kind of time for it. So just know what happens, know how we're doing it, and, well, know what's going on there. So we've got two different types of authentication enabled at this point in time. Uh, so let's try something a little bit, well, more interesting. So let's go in and say... Hmm, now what do we have in R2? Okay, so let's go back to R2 over here and take a look at all my OSPF config. Oop. Spell it correctly would help out quite a bit. And we have authentication key, which we can actually get rid of if we care to. Uh, extra configuration won't matter, so not the end of the world. But we got the message digest key there. We've got the area authentication enabled for both of my areas. Things should be pretty good. Now, Let's go over to R4. Uh, so take a look real quick at my diagram, and we've got area 40 and area 41 that we want to actually configure on there. Uh, so it should be fairly simple and straightforward. I mean, I'm not going to do any authentication for it. It's just kind of right there. So when I start looking at it, take a look at my IP addresses. So there's my networks. So router OSPF1. Network 150.100.40.4. And up arrow for that part. So I have both of the interfaces up as far as OSPF is concerned. Now, quite honestly, I don't have any neighbors in those areas. I've got nothing else connected to those particular interfaces. If your lab says anything about not sending extraneous updates out or you know a security concern that you don't want to 
be unaware of who you're peering with on edge networks or something along those lines, then I'd want to go back in and do passive. Uh, so we can do that if you want to. Say passive, capacity ethernet zero, zero, and same thing for one. Now notice it said no full neighbors to build the LSA for. It declared itself the DR, but at the flip side, we're going to go ahead and say passive and really not care about it one way or the other. So looking at IPOSPF interfaces at that point, I still have them listed as OSPF interfaces. But at the same time, I have basically nothing set up for it. So no uh, configuration or no uh, hellos going out because both of them will reflect that they're a passive interface. So question is now, do we have that information in there? So let's go back. What are we looking at? Yeah, okay. So let's go back to R2 and see a do show IP route OSPF. And I do not see anything beyond 200.0.0.4, which is R4's loopback interface. Well, let's go back and look at our diagram here. Now, one of the rules in OSPF version 2 is that every LSA must transit area 0. And every area must directly touch area 0. That's kind of my, my big starting point for this. So the problem we have here is that they're not touching area 0. We have area 24 stuck in the middle. So this is going to be our introduction to virtual links. We're not going to do anything too fancy with them quite yet, but this is going to be an introduction to virtual links. So first thing we need to do between R2 and R4 is take a look at what our router ID is. So we can do a show IP OSPF, or if you're particularly uh, not wanting to look at all of that stuff, include ID. So we have our two's information, do show IP OSPF, include ID capitalized, and there's our four's information. So we can build a virtual link at this point in time. So area 24, virtual link. Um, what was it that we had? 224.001 over here. Yep, 224.001. Enter. Our two. Yeah, see, now we're getting virtual link there, so area 24, virtual link, 200.0.0.4. Ah, oh, we're in the sub-interface, our OSPF 1. Okay, so now we should at least stop those messages about mismatch area IDs and all the fun stuff like that. But question is, are we going to set things up correctly? So if I look at my virtual link, the virtual link itself is up. So it's a good thing. Right. When I look at virtual link over here, well, see, at least I'm getting errors because my debugs are still running. This is a good sign. When I look at the output for show IP OSPF virtual link, again, it shows that it's up. But two different things. The virtual link must come up. That tells me that I have reachability between the ABRs. But the other thing is that I must form a peer, and that's where my adjacency is failing at this point. So on this virtual link, I don't see any authentication enabled. Over on R2, on the other hand, I have message digest authentication enabled, but there's no key configured. All right, so a couple different things that we have to do. So on router 4, I have to enable message digest authentication for that virtual link. Now, I can do it via the Area 0 mess you know, Authentication Message Digest. That's a way to do it. Or I can actually do it on the virtual link. Let me just up arrow here in question mark and see the types of things that I have. So Authentication Message Digest. So as soon as I do this, I show IP OSPF virtual link. I have Message Digest Authentication show IP OSPF neighbors, and I actually peer with that neighbor twice. Once over the serial link, and once over the virtual link. Right, so good stuff as far as that goes. However, I'm still going to lose points. The reason I'm going to lose points is because of this, that I'm still using key ID 0. I also need to go in and configure the key, if we're told Cisco's the password or whatever the password is, 
but I need to configure the key on that same virtual link. Now, we already used my virtual link statement right here for that. I can actually put another one in. So this is going to give the example of not doing the area-based. If I'm doing area-based, then all I have to do is this. So message digest key 1 MD5 Cisco. Ah, that's going to give me a pain there. So it has message digest key, so why doesn't it like that? Message digest key 1 MD5 Cisco. Okay, so apparently it's just being pretty picky about something at that point. So in any event, tab works perfectly cool for it. it used to be that we could type it in shortcut wise. Now what we're going to get, however, is, well, at least after, uh, what, 40 seconds down here, because we're point-to-point -point link, this one's going to go down, and we're going to start getting authentication key errors, not the authentication type that we got before. Uh, so that was the first thing that we used to see up here, mismatching the authentication type. But after 40 seconds or so, when we wait for this to go down, we're going to start seeing authentication key errors because of our difference. I'll put you on pause for a second so you don't have to listen to me for 40 seconds. Actually, we'll spare you some even more time. After looking at it for just a minute, kind of thinking through things on here, we're not going to see it go down yet. Because a virtual link, very important piece of information here, is run as a demand circuit. This means that if nothing changes, it's not going to send any updates out. So, quite honestly, we're not going to realize that we have a key mismatch until... I either add or subtract something from the virtual link there. So that may be a surprise that comes later on. So even though I've got key 0 on this side, and over on R4, I got key 1 being used, where we would see an authentication mismatch or an authentication key mismatch, I'm actually not going to recognize it quite yet. Okay, so let's play around with that a little bit. So my IP address is, and I think I already have all of those in areas as it is right now. So let's just go ahead and add another one, just because we can. Uh, so given an interface at that point, router OSPF1, network 200.241.4, Okay, so LSH there is going up. We're going to actually be sending it out. And let's see what happens now with the routers. Okay, notice I do not have that LSA showing up. So 200.241.0 is not in my list on R2. Okay, well, we're seeing in my adjacency that I've actually got key information being sent out here. Not seeing problems quite yet. Hasn't quite been 40 seconds. Alright, so I have the information in my OSPF database, so we're doing good from that standpoint. Got an update. Got youngest keys. Now this is where we're getting into some errors. There we go. Mismatch authentication key. So basically, neighbor went down at this point. I think we might have killed our debugs over here. Yeah, that's why we didn't see it on R2. Okay, so as soon as that happened, where we issued a change, where we saw something change and needed to send it out, that's when it started our 40-second timer because things were not matching correctly. So that demand circuit is certainly going to be a problem on there. So let's see where our area virtual link is here. Message digest key 1, MD5, Cisco. We'll see when that neighbor comes back up. Should be fairly soon here. Key exchanges every 10 seconds. There we go. We're up to full. And check out our routes. And we're waiting. We're waiting. There we go. Now we got it in the routing table. And now I actually have this route on there. Okay. So those are the differences, and that's kind of an important lesson in terms of where and when we see the changes on here and how it's going to occur. Right? So very interesting things, but those are the details 
of authentication and how and where to check it out. So we're going to kind of take our OSPF network a step further by this point. So we've already built area 0 and area 24 and we've attached area 40 and 41 into the mix of things. So we're doing pretty good as far as our basic configuration goes. Now I want to go ahead and add a couple, well really the rest of our areas in and kind of bring us to our next topic. So a lot of these we can do simply from notepad arrangements. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of that part on there and start with R2, start our OSPF1. Okay, so this is going to be some very basic things. We're not going to do any fancy authentication or anything like this. Hey, notice I did a uh, uh, the full slash 24 mask on that one. Again, shouldn't be any bearing on anything or do any difference. I am, however, going to make that interface passive just in case my backbone's injecting some routes and whether or not I match the areas and just don't feel like paying attention to it right now. So one thing at a time as far as troubleshooting stuff. In your real lab, you may consider doing that too, making the interfaces out to um, your backbone's passive at the very beginning just so you are not distracted uh, in case they're passing a quantity of routes to you or anything else. So we kind of take things by a divide and conquer approach. So make sure you get your adjacencies up and going, any filtering, the authentication, any small stuff like that. Make sure that everything's working first, then bring in any routes from the backbones and do any secondary manipulations that you have to do. Okay? So area 10 should be straightforward at that point. Now, let's see, what other routers do we have? What other interfaces? We already did router 4 up there. Got router 1, got router 2, got that all set. So now down to 5 and 6. Okay, so both 5 and 6 need to have uh, area 567 defined. And we actually have two networks in there. All right, so we're not going to get too fancy about who's in charge of it or anything like that. But 5, 6, and 7 will all have the same information there. So cutting and pasting is a good place to start for it. And also notice that I did the entire slash 24, so at least I don't have to go change IP addresses on there. So we're, of course, going to have some other things involved. So when we're taking a look at, scroll up here a bit, on R6, when we start going past that, we're going to have some more networks. So network, yeah, yeah 150, 100, there we go. 150, 100.69.0. Area 69, and our 7 is going to add network 150.100.78.7, area 780. We'll also probably want to go ahead and add our loopbacks in there. Honestly, it doesn't matter where we add those loopbacks into the mix and all. Oh, we've already got 6's network in there, so don't need to worry about that. So R7's had to be added. That part's good for it. So let's see, then we've got R8. put all of its interfaces. And you know, actually we can do it a different way. Since everything on R8 is gonna be in here, let's do it with zeros. 
let's kind of take the quick and easy approach there. Now, normally from a wild card mask, I would tell you that the second grouping should be all 255s, but in iOS, they actually basically correct it for you, so you really can put the quad zeros twice and be perfectly fine with it. And we'll do that passive to our backbone again, just to be safe on that, on our nine. We do have two different areas. Okay, so we should be good as far as putting all of our information. Oh yeah, we'll do passive on here also, uh, just to make sure that we don't have extraneous stuff coming in. So now it's just going to be a matter of pasting that information into our existing routers. So let's see, we'll start with R2 then, get that information in, and go on to R1. And we should see some peers come up here pretty shortly. Five's information. And our sixes. So from putting in the configuration standpoint, you can start to appreciate how much notepad can actually help you out in terms of just the cutting and pasting idea or as far as how fast you can get things together or copying between them. And so R9, all that stuff set, and we can go back and double check on things. Uh, so good stuff there. Try POS with neighbors, actually want to do that to everybody since we can. And uh, so I've got peers between R1 and R2, so that's cool, so I'm not peering the backbone. R2, got pretty much everybody I expect to, R4, same type of thing, R5, now we have, oh, okay, so we had stuff that was going up and uh, uh, in the process of going up at that point. So, so I post with neighbors again, I do have more than one peer with R7 and more than one peer with R6. One of them's under fast ethernet 01, one of them's fast ethernet 00. So per my diagram, that's pretty much what I expect. I've got two Ethernet links inside Area 567. Right, so that's good. So R6, I'm peering with 9 here, peering with 5 twice, 7 twice, and 5, 3, oh yeah, 5, 3 times because it's going to be under the, the frame relay interface too. So yeah, different little things you got at that point in time. Right, so when we look at this, Number nine. So we have our information in there. Now, question is, as we go through, and you can take a look at the rest of them too, there's seven, there's eight as we expect to, there's nine uh, as we expect to only peer into six. But as we go through here now, question is, do I have routes to everything? Hmm? Now, the short answer, to take a look at the loopbacks. What am I missing? I have four, five, six, and seven. I do not have R1, I do not have R8, and I do not have R9. So look at my diagram real quick. Now R1 should be in area 10, which is directly attached to R2, which touches area 0. So there's no reason I shouldn't have R1, so we'll have to take a look at that. Now on R9, that's going to be in area 90, which is removed from area 0. Same thing with area 780 for R8. Uh, so I am going to have to do some more virtual links in order to actually get this all working in there. Uh, so different pieces involved in it. So as we look at the things, or as we want to go past the different pieces involved there, so what I need to do, or what the, we need to get involved in at this point, uh, so let's take a look at R1. And do show run 
section OSPF. And well, that would be a pretty good reason. We forgot to put the loop back in here. So that's a pretty simple fix. We could have done that that network for all zeros here also. Right. So let's check that out again and see voila. Okay, so there's our one. So that's kind of the easy part. Now seven and eight are going to be a little bit different, or or uh, eight and nine, sorry, are going to be a little bit different there. So when we start looking at this, I need to build a virtual link over to R7. Now question is, do I build it from five or do I build it from six or do I build it from both? Right? And that kind of brings an interesting, um, well, dilemma, but an interesting thought process as far as which way do you want to go. Now, quite honestly, both R5 and R6 touch area zero. And what happens if I want multiple paths out or have multiple options in case one of them fails? So it really depends on how much you're looking at failover capability or what different kinds of things that we can have going on there. So taking a look at our notepad idea. Right, so let's kind of break this to a different section here. So on R5, R6, and R7, we're going to start building some virtual links. Honestly, R5 and R6 are going to have the same information. Now, keep in mind some of the things that we've learned before. Right, so this really shouldn't be anything new to us at all. So as we get in here, R5 and R6, so we've got, what, area... 567 virtual link 200.0.0.7 message digest key one md5 cisco because both of those devices already have area zero authentication enabled so copying things down let's make it for r7 which will need that virtual link command there, except for the fact that we're going to change this to 5 and this to 6. And I will also go ahead and add in area 0 authentication message digest into it. So that'll be my difference there. So copy and paste these to R5 and R6. So here's our five paste that our six paste that and there's our sevens information paste that okay. so we should start to see things change on here okay. do show ip ov okay. so i have two virtual links at this point vl1 is down vl0 is up so you kind of have to wonder about that how is that actually working on here? So I received a packet, mismatch ID, from a different guy. Now, what did we do wrong at that point? Ah, what we did wrong is we put the wrong router ID on there. Forget that we changed, oh, here it is, R6's router ID. All right, so that's going to be a difference. All right, so when we get to this, I'm going to do no for that one. Actually, you don't need to duplicate the message stuff. And we want to change this to 223, 255, 255, 255. So that should be the valid way to do it. Okay, now again, using your notepad, even though we made a mistake right here, so we had a problem for it, the corrections were that much easier. Rather than doing a show run, highlighting what you had there, pasting it over to Notepad, editing it around, and then pasting it back, it was already in Notepad waiting for us. So there's a lot of different reasons why it's a good idea to use Notepad to the full advantage that you can. Okay. So now, on here, do show IP OSPF neighbor, and we should see... Oh, we've got all sorts of things going on, but most importantly, I have two peers involving virtual links. And so I got R5 and got R6 on there. When we go back over to R2 and do a show IP route OSPF, I should start to see, yep, there we go. 
information about RH loopback. And I actually have two reachable interfaces there. So one via R5 and one via R6. And I saw good stuff as far as that goes. Now, on R6 and R9, so there's going to be our next step. So between here, we need to do the same thing for a virtual link. Because right? we're crossing area 69, going to be defining this information right here. So scoot this back over this way. And kind of copy this. Yeah, we'll just type it out. So R6 is going to have router SPF1, area 69, virtual link 200.009. Okay, just add that information in there. R9, on the other hand, will need the whole gamut of stuff. And don't forget about that changed router ID. Okay, so we got R9's information that we can paste in wherever that is. Oh. And we have R6's information paste in. Okay. And there we go. We should have our neighbors. Okay, got two neighbors, one over the serial interface, one over the virtual link interface. Let's go back to R2 and take a look at our routes. And there we are. We have 200.0.0.9 as far as being reachable. So going to a furthest point. So it was good to kind of step through where we're at. Six. There's our seven. And the two furthest ones being our eight and our nine. And we got full reachability through there. So our idea of adding the virtual links and making sure we do other authentication, perfectly cool. Now, what if we want to make this a little bit more fun? I mean, what kinds of stuff can we do to add to this mayhem in here? I, hmm. Kind of give you something to think about for a minute. Let's go back to our diagram, because I don't have any more areas on the diagram here. But what if we wanted to add our backbone routers into it? and say that we had some, well, you know, different stuff going on here, some extra areas added in. So I'll let you ponder that for just a second, and we'll come back and think about adding that. So checking out our diagram here, kind of pondering through how I get everything set up, let's add a couple things. Okay? So we're going to go ahead, at least on R6 and R9, and um, take off the passive interface there. So I want to start peering with those two backbone routers. Now, the other thing that we might find is that we're going to be told that there are going to be routes coming from the backbone routers. No surprise, that's what backbone routers are for. What we might be surprised with, especially looking at this diagram here, is to find out that BB2 uses area 200 and BB3 uses area 300 for all of the routes they're going to be bringing into you. Now, if we were supposed to change the network, okay, so like on R9 to BB3, that 100, 150.0 network, if we were supposed to change that into area 300, it really wouldn't be anything else we'd have to do because with the virtual link, area 0 is already out at R9. So adding another area to connect is no big deal, just like what we did at R4. We only needed one single virtual link to bring area 0 out to R4, and then adding area 40 and 41 or whatever other areas we would add it would not make any difference. So our complication is going to be that that link, the 100, 150.0 network, is still going to be in area 90. So BB3 will be in ABR, as will BB2. 
that's where things get a little bit more complicated. So let's go ahead and go do our no passives. Okay, so configure router, so we should be good. We'll go ahead and type it in just for giggles there. No passive F00, which I think is where we're at. Yes, fast even zero zero. And do the same thing on R6. Now as soon as we do that, we see a neighbor happen to come up. So we're gonna have neighbors showing up at this point in time or see what happens there. But at the same time, we're gonna start seeing these types of things right here. Now, it's good that we get those messages because if nothing else, we're gonna have a reminder that we should have a virtual link there. So we're gonna start seeing that information on there, start seeing that uh, set of difficulties. Whoops, R6 is not what I wanted. R8 was what I wanted. which of course would explain why we didn't see anything on R6. So there we go. So looking at that information or seeing the differences. Now, when we get down to that or when we start seeing who it is. So show IP OSPF neighbor on here is gonna tell me this information. So there is the router ID that I need to use to set up my virtual link. So area, we're on R8, so that'd be 780 virtual link 218.15.144.200 message digest key 1 md5 cisco now question is of course do show run section ospf how did we do the configuration so we did not do area 0 authentication portion so that's going to be a little bit of a difference as far as where we're configured on here. So what we'd actually done before was we did from R7 coming out here. So look, look at our diagram. Now, R8, we just configured that virtual link on, isn't going to help us. All right, so that's why we didn't have any other information there how it's going to be. So our last virtual link went from R5, well, and R6, up to R7. So R7 is in 780. R8 is in 780 as well, but really just a middleman. It is not a border router. That's going to be one of the key distinctions in there, is putting a virtual link on R8 will not help anything whatsoever. Uh, so we're not going to see anything as far as that goes. All we're going to start seeing is, well, things just don't match or don't make any sense on there. So taking a look at R7. So let's go ahead and we'll go back to R8 and remove that information there. Control A to get to the beginning of the line and say no. Now at the same time, probably go ahead and at least copy that part right there. So that we can go over to R7 and paste it. Virtual link, message digest, key one, MD5, Cisco. run section OSPF make sure we don't have to put the message digest authentication portion in there nope we've got the area zero message digest authentication so we should be good to go as far as that portion right there so let's check that out so at this point we're gonna be good we have a virtual link that's gone up and theoretically I should start to see a whole bunch of extra routes And there we go. It's a bunch of inter-area ones. The 202s and 218s are all coming in from Backbone 3. And yeah, there'll be quite a few of them. So let's go over to R9. And we can do the same thing. So we've got our basic peer on here, but we're going forward and trying to figure out what's up because of the virtual link idea. So looking back at our diagram, here we don't have a, a router in the middle. So R8, we're, you know, like we ignored on R8. But here on R9, we can actually make the change. Okay, so we just set up another virtual link crossing 90. And as far as we know, and as far as we go, that's the piece that's going to be in there. So here is the router ID of our peer there at Backbone 3. So copy that 
and say area 90 virtual link paste that information whoop that wasn't what we wanted right there copy paste okay message digest key one md5 cisco and see how that goes go virtual link one up loading to full everybody should be fine show ip route ospf and we'll see what ones go out the fast ethernet right there should be a bunch of 102 networks absolutely so we're good to go and we have both the area 300 added on there and the area 200. so what we did is basically nested or concurrently hopped our virtual links so the whole idea, and kind of remember this for our authentication and everything else, just like we talked about in the theory, what we're doing is extending area zero out, hop by hop by hop, and seeing that information propagate. So as we move through here, perfectly cool to do, and we should have a fully robust network at this point in time. So for our next exercise in OSPF, I want to start talking a little bit about stub areas and seeing what kinds of, well, entertaining things that we can do with them. Now, we've made a few changes in our backbone router configs uh, as far as how they happen to go in there. So right now, BB1 has been brought in to Area 10, so fairly simple and straightforward, and it's redistributing a bunch of routes showing up as E2s. On the other hand, um, BB2 has been moved into Area 780, which is where it was before, but we really got rid of the other external area. So got rid of our virtual link that we had added in there before. At least if you listen to the virtual link section first, you would know that part. Um, but otherwise, we have brought stuff in and brought them in as E1 routes. On BB3, on the other hand, we still have all of that information there uh, and have Area 300 and all of the fun routes that we've brought in from that particular aspect. Now, what we want to do next is really kind of play around a little bit and see where we're at in terms of reachability, in terms of how we're going to, well, you know, mess things up in new and exciting ways or otherwise affect how our routing actually works. Okay? So we've got a couple routes to kind of keep in mind, and we'll go ahead and do some uh, show commands just to see where we're at with those. But as far as testing goes, our purposes are going to be quite simple in that we want to look at reachability as far as a few different routes. So from BB1, I have show IP route 154.11.11.0. And I've got that, so that's perfectly cool. External type 2, do show IP route 66.110.173.0, and should find the same type of thing. Okay, both of those are coming from BB1. So if you look back at the diagram, see via fast Ethernet 1.0 on there, that heads up to R1, and then out to BB1. On the flip side, a couple other routes we have do show IP route. 202.0.0.0 and what I'm going to look at here is seeing E1 and it'll be from two different paths but that tells me it's going to be coming down from BB2 at that point in time and same thing with uh, 218.4.48.0 and I should find the same information there okay so perfectly simple straightforward for those and then a couple of BB3 routes Show IP route 102.0.0.0. And so I got a couple different subnets on there. Yeah, well, okay, so the slash 8 variable subnetted. Now, since those are internal routes, that's why it happens to be showing up that way. So I'll be looking at that. Um, let me do it for a specific route on there just to get the one subnet that we want there. But it's going to be an inter-area route that we're seeing as far as live reachability on there. And same type of thing we should be able to do with 102.5.64.0. And see that information on there as well as the slash 22 that it's coming from. So those are the things that we really want to check and track as far as reachability once we're done with our changes.
Okay, so now the question is what types of stubs are we going to come up with? Let's go back and take a look at our diagram there. And as I start looking at it, so let's say one of the first things I want to do is take area 10 and make that into a stub area. Okay. So when I get to this, one of the things that I'm going to have to keep in mind is that I'm really not allowed to do changes, per se, on any of my backbone areas there. So it's going to kind of cause me, well, some issues. Okay. So some problems along the way that we have in that I can't reconfigure BB1. So if it's not listed as a stub area right now, then I can't do much with it, and it wouldn't be as a stub area right now because we have redistribution going on. So I can't do anything in terms of the redistribution there. So how are we going to break up the area or set things up such that R1 sees it as some type of stub area on there? We really have kind of a couple different dilemmas going on. So first of all, the redistribution into a stub area, that in and of itself is not that big of a deal. Because anytime we're going to do redistribution, that kind of tells me that it has to be NSSA. The part that's going to be the hard one to think through is the idea that I can't go to BB1 and make changes. And if it was already set up as an NSSA or any sort of stub area, I wouldn't have a peer right now uh, because we have to agree on that stub flag. And as it is, router 1 is not set, or router 2 for that matter, is not set up for a stub flag with it. So how are we going to look at it? Because at the same time, I'm also not allowed to change the areas because that too would either mean that I'd alter my diagram or that I have to go to BB1 and make some sort of change in there, which is not going to be allowed to happen. So here's an interesting one for you to ponder. Is there any reason why we couldn't have multiple OSPF processes, both of which have Area 10? I mean, seems like a decent idea. There wouldn't be any automatic exchange, so it's not like IGRP and EIGRP or anything fun like that. So there's no automatic redistribution there. There's also no automatic sharing of information, even though the area numbers are the same. But what it does is it allows me to separate things out. So on router 1, I can have a second OSPF process that simply runs area 10. I honestly don't even have to touch area 0 at that point. It's just you know, one of those things that I don't have to worry about in there. And on the other side of Area 10, I can set it up as a stub area or any type of stub that I want to. Now, realistically, I'll set it up as NSSA because that will allow me the redistribution portion. But rules are, the only thing that I have to do is make Area 10 some sort of stub area, but maintain connectivity. Okay? So those are the things where the rules are going to come in fairly small, but it's going to be, well, a lot of thinking or a lot of things to be worrying about on there. Okay? So let's kind of plan things out a little bit. Let's go back in here and go over to R1 and take a look at our OSPF stuff. So fairly straightforward, fairly simple on there, not really any magic to it whatsoever. So as we go in, to plan this out then. R1 is really where we're going to be at. So router OSPF1 and what I want to do is remove the 100 network. Right. At the same time I'll go make an OSPF2 and say network 100.100.100.0 which I should fix that 100 right there. Uh, and put that portion in there just by itself. So, that part, as we see it, will allow things to be broken up just fine. All right, so when I start looking at stuff on here, so let's go in and go ahead and paste that and break those things up. Now, what I'm going to do is remove my neighbor at that point, so BB1 neighbor happens to go down, 
but at the same time I'll be starting a second OSPF process and we should be negotiating that piece of information on there. Right? So information that we're going to get or that we're going to see as far as the reachability. And we always love that it takes a while, but let's just real quick do show IP OSPF interface and make sure that our interfaces are still on there. Okay, so fast ethernet 01, that's perfectly cool as far as that goes. Notice that it says process ID number two, and then everything else is going to show up as process ID number one. And there's our second neighbor right there. That's good stuff. So let's see, we said that those things were coming in as E2 routes, if I'm not mistaken. So do show IP route to OSPF, include E2. And what do we see? We see a whole bunch of different routes in there, reachable via fast ethernet 01. So that's perfectly cool for it. So I can do, do ping 154.11.11.200 and should be perfectly reachable. Now, if I go just one hop away, however, to show IP route 154.11.11.0, and I see nothing at all. To show IP route OSPF, include E2, and I see nothing at all. So everybody else has now lost connectivity to BB1 routes. Okay? R1 still has, so that's a start. So the next thing that we want to look at, or the next piece of the puzzle in there, is to make area 10 a stub area, all right? at least as far as our routers are concerned. So going ahead and doing that, when I look at OSPF1 at that point, so going back to my diagram, I've got area 10 on router 2, router 1, and we already talked about BB1 on there. Right, so router 2 and router 1 are where I'm going to have my own configuration. So do show run section OSPF and I go forward to that and say okay well I only got one link with area 10 there that's really not that big of a deal nothing else special or fancy going on so we can do area 10 uh, what did we want to call it so we got stub areas but we know that we're gonna have to do redistribution on here so quite honestly that's gonna have to be an NSSA area right? or we could even do NSSA no summaries uh, so we, we can have a lot more fun with that. Keep the routing table nice and small and just go ahead and do NSSA, no summaries. Okay, now that'll cause peering problems right there because, well, the, the peer no longer agrees as far as that stub flag goes. Hate when that happens. So router OSPF1, area 10, NSSA, no summaries. So, we should see, momentarily, our neighbors go back up here in just a second. Okay, fast Ethernet 00, zero portion, anyhow. And this is going to be a good thing. Okay, so loading to full. That's all perfectly cool. Do show IP route. OSPF. Exclude E2s. So, I will see everything that's not an E2 route. And really don't get that much. Well, the kind of nice thing about it is, you know, the whole idea is that I only need that zero, zero. So that's going to be kind of the gist of things on there. But it is a stub type area. We greatly reduced everything, but I should still have full reachability to everything in my own network. So let's try that out. So do ping. Let's try the BB2 routes, 202.0.0.200, source loopback zero. And I got reachability there. Same thing we'll try with BB3. And I got reachability there. So, so far we're doing pretty good. We've got everything worked out where R1, even though it doesn't see the specific information, still has full reachability in there. But we still haven't done that redistribution part. So since we're on R1 here, uh, what I can do, go back over here, and say R1, R OSPF 1, redistribute OSPF 2 subnets. Okay. Now, I don't necessarily have to do anything fancy here. I can if I feel like it, you know, if there's any rules or restrictions or anything else as far as how we're going to set things up or how the different routes are going to go. But really, for the most part, not much I'm going to do. 
Now I can look at things. We can go back over here and scroll back up real quick and notice that everything came in as an E2 with 100. So if we want, we can go ahead and keep the metric the same. Just say metric 100. Right. And that'll kind of do that part. So go over here, paste that into R1. And we should, at this point in time, back on R2, get some information. Do show IP route 154.11.11.0. There we go. Now I have it as an NSSA type 2. It has a cost of 100 or metric of 100 in there. So do show IP route OSPF. Include 154.11.11. .11. And we have that information right there. Now, if I go to the next top down, so let's pick our R5. Do show IP route 154.11. Uh, OSPF include 154.11.11. And I see that as an E2, because of course we cross over the border and change it from the NSSA area, the type 7s, into a type 5 LSA. But, key thing is from my edges. Do I have reachability? Hmm. The answer is no. Now, why don't I have this here? Well, let's do it. Try it another way. Do show IP route to OSPF 124 oh, include 4.11.11. I see the route. So I should be able to get to the route. So why can't I ping it? Now, you got to remember that routing works both directions. And what we did not do was advertise anything back into the other OSPF process. Yeah, quite honestly, since I looked at things in terms of our basic configuration there and didn't really do much other than the NSSA no summaries, when I look at my routing table on router one from my internal pods OSPF routing there, I don't have much detail. So what am I going to pass along other than a default route? Right. So let's go back to R1 and see what we can't do in terms of router OSPF1 and default information originate. Always a good place to be. Now, question is, do I want to always do it? Answers, yeah, probably. Go ahead and put that information in there. So now as soon as I do that default route, now do I have reachability? Back to R9, try to ping that bad boy. And yeah, we're still not getting that information. So where are we falling short in terms of what we're allowing or what we're sending out? So let's go back to R1 a second. Now when we, oh, you know, you know what we just did? We did a zero zero route into OSPF one, which is kind of what we're learning from our ABR anyway. So yeah, you don't want to be doing that. All right, so we'll take that part out. We'll go back to OSPF two, which is the one that we need to do it on. And we'll tell it to originate the default route in that direction. It's those small things in life if you don't pay attention to it. So how about now? Now we have pingage. Uh, yeah, it's a technical term, by the way. But as we go through here, making sure not only that we send the correct routes the correct directions, but we're solving each little piece of connectivity in there while still dealing within the rules that are set in the lab. So we have an NSSA area, or we have A stub areas, which we were told, doesn't matter what kind. So we filtered the routes out, didn't get any specifics or worried about any specifics or anything like that as far as R1 is concerned, but still separated everything so that we didn't have to make any modifications on a backbone router, which we wouldn't be allowed to do anyway. So those are the kind of steps that we went through in there in order to separate things, still maintain full connectivity both directions, and give all of the information that we needed to. So those are kind of the important pieces in there in that first idea of our stub. So, so far, we're doing pretty good at that. So nothing to worry about on there. Now, as a next step, so basically looking at the next requirement down the line, let's go back to our diagram at this point and kind of take a look at other areas there. 
you can kind of know that it's going to you know, start highlighting our backbone routers someplace along the way. But what happens then if we want to go and make area 780 into an NSSA area? Hmm? I mean, all right, that seems relatively straightforward and simple to do at that point. Um, are we going to have any problems with it? Is it going to make any difference there? Well, we'll run into the same thing. Okay, so we're going to have some of the similar ideas or problems or concepts that we had with BB1 in that I can't modify BB2, so I'm going to have to kind of split things up a little bit. So, all right, I mean, seems like a straightforward and simple and similar task, but they told us specifically NSSA, okay, not the NSSA no summaries. So that might make a difference to us. But let's just kind of take it one step at a time. We go through our notepad then and see, you know, pretty much similar configuration at that point. We we'll go on to router 8 and say router OSPF 1. I suppose we should probably take a look at what router 8 is set up with right now. So we'll see what our sections are. Well, that's pretty simple. So, yeah, unfortunately, we're going to have to lose our network command for doing everything there. Good thing that wasn't one of the requirements. Uh, it's always nice to look cute right up into the point you got to change something. So let's see. Um, well, no, we could even still do that. We could even take a look at that. But what we want to do is write our SPF one and say passive interface fast Ethernet zero zero. I think is our diagram right there. So I'm going to do passive out going out to BB2. Uh, so that'll, of course, kill the neighbor relationship right there. Still advertise the route, but, you know, kind of kill everything else along the way. So, let's see. We got that part. So that'll kill that. Router OSPF 2 network 100.100.200.0. I uh, so got that part in there. Well, we already know about that default information originate, so we might want to do that one already. All right, so put that bad boy in there. Let's see, we wanted to do area 780 NSSA. Keep that. All right, so that should all be good. I want to redistribute OSPF2 subnets metric type 1 metric 200 just to be similar with what we have right now so we've got that portion in there doing good all right so that should be it as far as r8 is concerned uh bb2 we shouldn't have to make any changes to hopefully on the peering will work r7 on the other hand all we have to do is go into router ospf1 and say area 780 NSSA. So we should be good, right? I mean, that should should be perfectly fine. That, that makes perfect sense. All right. So let's start taking a look at pounding these things in here. So router 7, there's my information on that. Cut, paste, and okay, it's going to reset our peer, of course. And router 8 has the bigger configuration there. Let's paste that information in. All right. So, killed my session with um, my fast ethernet 0, 0, so out to BB2. That's all done. Killed my session with R7 because it'll be going back up for NSSA. So, that part's all done in there. So, do show IP route OSPF include E1. Okay, so, oh, we've got nothing yet because my links to BB2 hasn't come back yet. So when we look at things, well, we still haven't got a peer coming back up. So let's take a look at our interfaces. Do show IP OSPF interface, and we'll just leave it like that, kind of scroll through things. So as I start looking at things, FA00 is certainly going to be important to me, and I have my 100, 100, 200 network right here, so that's all cool. The problem is I see process ID number one. Now that's not what we wanted. 
So that might be part of our problem right there. So do show run section OSPF. Make sure we typed it incorrectly. Uh, Route OSPF 2, and there is the network. Yeah, that should all be there. Problem is, one interface can only belong to one OSPF process at any point in time. And because of this network right here, and the fact that it was in there first, it belongs to the first OSPF process. So the drawback here is we are going to need to go and kind of recreate that stuff. So as we look at things on here, so router OSPF1 now needs to be modified. Now we'll just do it down here so we can see the separation for it. So R8, router OSPF1, no network. 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. But let's see. Let's go do real quick. Do show IP interface brief. And back to our notepad and put all the rest of them in there. Okay, so we should be able to take out that network for everything, not put the 100, 100, 200 network back in there, but put all three of the other ones in just fine. So, highlight that, copy it, go and paste it to route, router 8. Now, at this point in time, we see things reset as it should be, changing our networks on there. Our 7 link happens to go back up. So let's do show IP OSPF interface FA00 and see where we're at. FA00 is still in process ID number one. Why are we still in process ID number one? That's not supposed to be doing that. So process ID number one doesn't have the 100 network in there. So let's just be safe. Yeah, still doesn't let us do one. All right, so yep, we're gonna go ahead and reset all of our processes. Figure the second one wasn't doing anything anyway, so what the heck. So now let's take a look at our interface there, and FA00 is still in process ID number one. Boy, it's just not letting go of this. So let's see what we have. Do show run section OSPF. Ah, probably because we have it listed as passive interface. So router OSPF1, no pass F00. And magically, amazing little things happen just because you have a leftover command in there. You might not think is very important. But it changes everything. So now, configs look fairly straightforward on that. Where's my interface command? There we go. We should see ourselves absolutely in process ID number two at that point. So we're all good. We have a peer. We saw that come up. So do show IP route OSPF include E1. And we see a whole bunch of information via fast Ethernet 00 right there. Now, Let's see, go over to AR7's pretty good. Do show IP route. What are we learning from BB2? 202.0.0.200. Okay, got my information in there. Do show IP route. 218.4.48.200. Well, let's call it zero. It uh, gives that information in there, shows it as an NSSA external type 1. So all of that information is pretty cool. If I go out to R2, do the same type of thing. Do show IP route. I should see this as an E1 now, absolutely. So N1s get translated into E1s. So it's definitely a good thing at that point. Now, of course, the question is, can I ping it? Mm. 
And the answer is no, it's not working. So we always got to love these things when they're not working there. So it was working before, because we did tests on this stuff before and knew that things were indeed working just fine. So let's see, why can't we see it? What can't we do? So what we have, router 2 looks at it via R6 and R5. All right. So do ping 200. Uh, oh, two. I wonder if we typed that wrong before. Yes, we did type that wrong before. So let's try it with the correct address and see if that makes a difference to us. There we go. Hey, magic things. <laughs> so when we're typing and looking at the details, remember it's very important to look at all those details and at least step it out, you know, do it out step by step so that we can hopefully catch any errors the second time around as we go to type it in and your brain goes, now wait a minute, that wasn't right. The little things in there. So we do have reachability on those routes. We saw those routes. Everything should be good now as far as the BB2 routes are concerned. So what part's next? All right. So back to checking out the diagram here. Now what we want to do next is let's make... Area 90, a stub no summaries. So we're going to specifically tell us how it's going to be set up. Say, okay, so make area 90 stub no summaries, which seems relatively straightforward there. Then we are going to add a network. And they may just tell you that the network is going to be 90.90.90.0. Uh, .90 .90 I do a slash 24, but they'll tell you to add a network in there and make it part of area 300. And that's all they're gonna tell you. So we wanna take area 90, make it into a stub no summaries, and add a network, 90.90.90.0 slash 24 in area 300. So looking at that and kind of looking at the diagram and you're sitting there thinking, all right, so where am I gonna be pulling this information from? Where am I specifically adding that 90 network? I mean, I've got a couple interfaces on there. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. Don't know about that. Well, like most stuff with the CCI lab, take it one step at a time. So the first thing I want to do, since Area 90 really only exists, at, well, at least as far as we're concerned here, on the uh, R9, why don't we go there and just go ahead and make that into a stub, no summaries, and see what happens. So click over here and let's click on R9 and router OSPF1. Make sure that that's the only router OSPF we have. Okay, should be good that way. Ah, now this may also tell us something when we start looking at this to remind ourselves of how we're configured. We do have an Area 90 virtual link that actually goes out to BB3. Hmm. All right, so let's see. Area 90 stub no summary yeah See, there's where the little hint is going to come in as soon as we try to configure that area cannot be a stub as it contains a virtual link which means since all of my routes from bb3 are inter area then that's why i've got that virtual link there configured and running all that information hmm 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 how do we set things up now? Well, remember, they told us we can add an interface. So you can add a network on there, and they gave us what that network was, 90.90.90.0 slash 24. Well, if you can't run a virtual link in order to connect two things together, how else are you going to connect two things together? A GRE tunnel. So we kind of have our answer right there as far as that configuration goes. So first thing I'm going to do inside router OSPF is get rid of my virtual link. So no, I'll highlight this and say cut, copy and paste. Enter. So virtual link should go down at this point in time, which it does. Now, with along with this, I should not see those BB3 routes. So do show IP route include... 102.0. Uh, we'll do the 5.64. Nope, no information there. 
route 102.0.0.200 and network not in table. Okay, so exactly the behavior I expect. I kill my virtual link. I'm no longer getting the information that I need to. So let's go ahead and add this. So now we can go back and do our stub anyway. The area 90 stub no summaries. That's all good. I really don't have any peers in it now, so whatever. So we're kind of taking a look at that point, changing that thing. So let's say interface tunnel zero. Uh, we got to set up a source and destination. Well, honestly, I'm only going over to BB3. So my source and destination really should be on that same interface right there. So the 100, 100, 250 network. So kind of step through that part. Well, I suppose first thing is, do I know what his address is? Uh, not via CDP neighbors. That's nothing fun like that. Um, hmm. Let's see. Do ping 100. Not 100. 200 or was it 250? 50. Dot. 255. Let's ping that broadcast address. And there we go. Now we got the address. Okay. So this is going to serve as our tunnel destination, by the way, in case you ever have to discover the IP address of a peer. So as we're looking at this, you know, it probably would have been easier to do a show IP if we have neighbors before we did those changes, but where's the fun in doing that? Okay, so in our tunnel, tunnel source, FA00, tunnel destination, 100.100.250.250, enter. We should see tunnel go up here in a minute. IP address 90.90.90.9 and there's that portion of it and let's see router OSPF 1 we'll do that now since I'm starting to get messages okay, so I start to see things in here as far as this particular link goes if we don't want those messages to appear what we can do is say passive fast ethernet 00, zero. Uh, I suppose it's always good to do a show IP interface brief and make sure that's the correct interface, which it should be, uh, and it is. Okay, and now we go into our router OSPF here and say network 90.90.90.9, 90 .90 000, area 300, I think is what we were told. And form an OSPF relationship, hopefully to BB3, over that tunnel interface and see what goes on from here. So ping 90.90.90.255 okay so we have a reply so we know that that guy exists over there now just a matter of seeing whether or not our OSPF relationship happens to come back so these are the good things boom and what we found at this point is our tunnel interface happens to come up life is pretty good and we have our information so let's see, do show IP route 100.102.0.0.200. I have a route for it. Do show IP route 102.5.64.0. I have a route for it. All right, let's go back over here and do the same type of thing. have her out. This is good. Make sure we type the right address this time. Excellent. Didn't need to do any redistribution or anything fun like that at all. Very good. All right. So when we go through things like this, we'll kind of see what types of ideas that we might be having going on. So let's go down to R8 at this point in time. Now, we looked at stuff. We have things as far as our neighbors go at this point. Now we have E1s, or we should still have E1s. Okay, see that information? Question is, do we have E2s? Okay, we're not gonna have any of those. Oh yeah, because we did some changes. So let's see, we show, well, let's go ahead and just do some pings. Do ping. Uh, 102.0.0.200, source loop back zero. 
Okay, got that. All right, so I have my BB3 routers. Uh, I certainly should have the BB2 routers, but we can go ahead and test those if you want to. Again, the correct ones would always make sense. Ah, we got a zero. I'm like, why would it not know source? <laughs> you gotta love this stuff sometimes. Okay, so got that, got reachability, that's how good. Do ping 154.11.11.200. And I'm not getting information back from BB1, or sending it out for that matter. Hmm. Do show IP route 154.11.11.200. Network not in table. All right, so let's go back one step. Let's see, R8 to R7. All right, so R7, do ping 154.11.11. .11. 200, search loop back zero, and that is perfectly reachable. So what about with a source of serial link? That's perfectly reachable. Hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. So, all right. Do ping, source zero, 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 serial. And I'm still not going to reach it. So R7 has a route, but R8 doesn't. Now, why would it be able to ping everything else but not that? Now, we could do a show IP route OSPF, but there's a lot of different routes in there. I uh, mean, if you want to see it just because we're bored or something, we can take a look at them. But because of what we're doing with the uh, inter-area stuff and all the different backbones, I got a whole lot of routes injected. It's just because I'm creative in that fashion. So when we start looking at it, this really isn't going to help us very much. And you might run into it like that in your real lab exam. This is called the freak me out because I have way too many routes. So, <laughs> at least if we know a couple of them to be looking for, this is a good place to go ahead and get started with it. So what I have is I've got some E1s, learn those from one process. I have my inter areas. I don't have the E2s. Now, what is it that we did that would cause that not to happen? Okay. And it keeps kind of going and going and going here. Uh, there we go. So that's the end of it. So do show run section OSPF. Now, what we have is apparently a failure to communicate. But beyond that, Area 780 NSSA. Now, here's where the important thing comes in. Kind of like we talked about in the theory section. NSSA, so plain, generic, all-purpose NSSA, is the only one that does not bring in a 00, zero route. So do show IP route 0000, zero, 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 and we have nada. So that's why R8 doesn't have any reachability. Because with any stub area, we lose connectivity to other externally uh, redistributed information, any type fives that we have wandering around, we lose those. So without the zero zero route, they're gone. And you got no way to reach them and no knowledge of it whatsoever. Now we can fix this. R seven is my ABR. All right, so do show run section OSPF and go into router OSPF one and where we say area seven eighty NSSA question mark. So one of the things that we can do is that default information originate right there. And that really is our important piece. Uh, so I can spend some biometric on it if I feel like, or a metric type. Or, you know, honestly, don't care about that. You only got one router in the area anyway, so no big deal. But that's the reachability problem that we have. So let me go ahead and do that. So we're going to change our notion at this point. Now, R8 should have that route. There you go, shows up as an N2 route, so I'm cool with that. Let me go ahead and see if we can ping that. Let's go from our loop back, just for giggles. And we have reachability. So when we do stub areas, we get a lot of different things to consider. But basically take each one step by step 
and everything will be good with it. There's not a whole lot. Well, I guess there is a little bit of magic, but there's not a whole lot of magic to it. So as soon as you come across any complicated task, it's all about how you approach the problem and do it in a step-by-step -step format that you can read your way through or work your way through anyway. And in the end, everything will be fine. But test it, test it, test it just to make sure. And, you know, don't forget if you're making any typos or fun places like that, then you might want to correct those too. But otherwise, that's the whole idea in there as far as my stub area configurations. Our next area of the OSPF technology has to do with metrics and the basic manipulations that we go for in there. Now, as a general rule, we take a look at the metrics as far as 10 to the 8th divided by bandwidth. Now, way back when, this kind of made sense. 10 to the 8th is 100 million. So if 10 meg Ethernet was your fastest link out there, well, you're doing pretty good. Today, things change a little bit. Right? So, I mean, we've got not only fast Ethernet links with the cost of one, but you've got OC3s, OC12s, gigabit Ethernet, you know, all sorts of fun things on top of that, which will kind of mess up your uh, permutations there, mess up your chances, because multiple types, such as a 10 gig Ethernet or a 1 gig or a 100 meg link. Now, if you had those three paths to choose from, it's pretty obvious, you know, you and I would be sitting there going, well, hell, I'll take the 10 gig one. That's a hell of a lot cooler, so let's play with that. OSPF, on the other hand, would say cost of one for each of them. And if everything was equal, you might have multiple paths in your routing table. Otherwise, it would go based on highest router ID of your peer over those links. So you may end up with the 100 meg path, the preferred one, and do all of your engineering based on that. So your router is routing and moving stuff, and you're sitting there wondering why you don't have any utilization in maybe one direction versus the other, but you don't have any utilization on your 10 gig link, and yet users are complaining that stuff is getting dropped or that traffic latency sucks. So you got to kind of watch out for things like this in terms of how each router makes its decisions. So one of the first things we want to look at is, let's say that some point in time in the future, um, hopefully the near future, at least if your Cisco sales team is doing a good job for you, you are going to be upgrading different links to 10 gig Ethernet. Okay, we're starting to play with that. Or at least we want to plan for it in terms of our routing processes. So we want to make sure that all of our calculations are done based on this 10 gig Ethernet standard. Uh, so as we start going through here, because this is really going to make a change on every single router that we have, but it's all part of our OSPF routing process. So router OSPF1 and question mark. What kinds of things do we have in here? Well, we should actually see it fairly close right at the beginning right there, which is auto cost. So calculate OSPF interface cost according to bandwidth. Uh, so let's kind of take a look at things just real briefly here. Do show IP OSPF interface include is up pipe cost. So we'll start to get an idea at this point in time. Our loopback, well, we don't really care about the loopback, whatever. But our fast Ethernet links are going to have cost of one. Uh, so let's go do this on something like R2 that has more than one type of link. All right, so we're going to see some differences in there. My T1 links have a cost of 64, which, okay, arguably, since it's multi-link or multi-interface uh, frame relay there, you might have adjusted your bandwidth to something different, but our lab, we're just going to pretend on here that didn't make a difference. So T1 or 1.5 meg equals an OSPF cost of 64. So let's say we go then to each of our routers and change that information. So all routers, router OSPF1, and then auto cost. Yeah, let's go back to R1 where we can at least do question mark on there. So auto cost, okay, reference bandwidth. All right, so the reference bandwidth in terms of megabits per second. Okay, so let's see. A fast Ethernet would be 100 meg. A gigabit link would be 1,000, and a 10 gig link would therefore be 10,000 megabits. Okay. So this is the information that I want to add in then to every one of my routers here. So 
So let's see. Let's go ahead and backspace so we can paste this in. Okay, so some differences we're definitely going to see. And it'll tell us with each one that, by the way, change at every place. So if I start looking now at my costs, I'm going to see some differences. And loopback, by the way, still has a cost of 1, whatever. My fast ethernets will now have a cost of 100. And we'll see that my ethernets, or my, uh, uh, my serial links, my T1 links, have a cost of 6,476. Just because they can. Now, one would reasonably ask if it was 6476, therefore divided by 100 was 64.76, why didn't it round up to 65? And that would be an excellent question, it's just it was programmed as an integer. So basically any fraction, no matter if it's 0 0.99, would still get dropped. So go figure. But anyway, cost of 1 is going to make that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things? Probably not. But as we start looking at this on here, gives us something else to play with or gives us something else to look at. Now, as we go through, we might find our costs, well, fairly prohibitive. Uh, so let's take another interesting one. Remember back on R9, we had a tunnel interface. Now, it used to have a cost of 11,111. Now it has a cost of 65,535 which, by the way, is the maximum cost that any link can have. So we might be running into some reachability problems when we have uh, either virtual links or tunnel interfaces as we change our bandwidth at this point. So interesting stuff. So let's see, what routes did we have over there? Um, our tunnel interface, that was area 300. So I'm trying to think of an easy way to go ahead and do it, but yeah, let's just do a show IP route OSPF. Exclude E1, well, E1 or 2. And so I do have stuff reachable still over tunnel 0, so 65,536. Okay, so we're still reachable as far as that metric goes, which is okay, but may not be the uh, acceptable behavior that we would like to see in there. Uh, so watch that stuff in terms of our additions or our additive reachability at that point in time. because We may run into some little issues along the way. So as we start looking at these things, we've changed your auto cost reference bandwidth. This gives us, well, different things to play with on there. So that's okay. That's good. That's one step. Configure that pretty simply. Now, next step in terms of metrics. Let's take a look at our tunnel interface here and say, what if we did have problems? Maybe our lab tells us that the tunnel interface or any routes over the tunnel interface should have a metric of 500 in my routing table on R9. Okay, that seems simple and straightforward. I mean, we just go, what, let's see, down to R9 here and say interface tunnel 0 and IPOSPF metric 500. Should be good, right? Now let's paste that in and see what happens. Okay. Oh, cost, not metric. Yeah, small things in life. So, we went ahead and did that. All right. So, let's go back up to our show IP OSPF here. And, oh, what do we have? We have 501. Yeah, that first link where they got brought in got added in. So, things were advertised to us with a cost of 1. And if we add 500 to it, that's going to make 501. So let's go back here real quick, and first of all, we can change our word to cost instead of metric, and say 499. So if the routes are supposed to show up in my table with a cost of 500, I have to give it a cost of 499 along the way. And still not working at that point. Maybe we just didn't wait long enough. That may be part of our behavioral problems on here. Let's see, do show IPOI ton zero. And I have a cost someplace along the way, cost of $4.99. There we go. Alright, so our calculations should be good at this point. And we have links. There we go. So timing issues. 
you always hate when that happens. Okay, now it does happen fairly quickly, but it's not exactly a uh, instantaneous snap your fingers and poof, there it is. So kind of watch that part as we recalculate the SPF. Remember, the more routes we have, the more of a pain that can actually be. But that'll be changing our metrics on there. So that's the next part. So really, we get two places as far as cost adjustment. I have individual interfaces, or I certainly have the auto cost reference bandwidth that we start looking at. So let's take things kind of a step further with that. Uh, so we've adjusted kind of our interface, we've adjusted our auto cost, so made changes pretty much globally to everybody. So let's say the next thing that we want to run into. Um, we have a bunch of E1 routes, so things that were learned from uh, Backbone 2. And we want to make sure that on R6, those show up with a cost of 7,500 in the routing table. And do not make any changes on R6 to make that happen. So I guess first thing to do is go to R6 and see what they actually look like right now. So do show IP route, OSPF, include E1. But as I get through these here, let's see, I got 6777. So what exactly does that entail? So as I start looking at it, 6777. Hmm. Well, let's go back to the graphic here real quick. So if I'm learning them from BB2, I already have my link on there. So I get whatever route from BB2 and see what the cost happens to be. And I believe they come in with a cost of 200 on that. And then I have, actually, they might be coming in this cost of 201. I hadn't thought about that part. We'll, we'll take a look at that cost in there. Then I have the serial link in between R7 and R8. So that's going to be, I think, what we said, 6476. So that should give me to a total of 6676 right now. And then I have the link, the Ethernet, whichever one I choose, going up to R6, which is going to be a cost of 100 since we changed our Ethernet bandwidth on there. So that should be 6776 as far as my addition goes. So let's check out on R8 and see what those routes look like on there. So on R8, let's see, do you show IP route, OSPF, include E1. And VFS Ethernet 00, zero. okay, so they got a cost of 201, so that's why we see them that way. So as we move those over, that's where that extra one comes in for where they started. You show run section OSPF. Okay, part of that reason is because we didn't do anything, we reset our metric. So learned it in OSPF 2, reset the metric to 200 over there coming in. So if we go to R7, say to show IP route OSPF, include E1, R7's, oh yeah, <laughs> that's because those would be N1's on R7. So that's going to be one little difference in there. So on here we have 6677 as far as our translation goes at that point in time. So they're NSSA routes, so we translate them over, we're going to add the 100 for the Ethernet link going up to R6, and that gives us the 6777 metric that we had. Now, so here's the next part. So at least we saw on R6 they were, what were they, the 66 or 6777? Okay, so 6777. Next thing we have, of course, is going to 7500. So what I need to do is we have a differential of 723 on there. At least, again, if my addition's right. Now, it's kind of early in the morning or late at night, depending on how you look at it. So it's entirely possible my addition's off. But it's good because we can test this stuff. So 723, that has to go someplace. And I'm not allowed to do it to R6. Well, I've got two places then. I can either go to R8 and change my redistribution metric right here, or I can go to R7 and basically change the cost of my serial link. Which 
average right now is 6476. So if I add 723 to it, that would make it 6499, uh, 6199, 7199. Right. So let's see, let's see. Interface serial 000, IPOSPF cost 7199. Enter. Back over to R6 and take a look at that. Yep, still hasn't changed yet. Yeah, you gotta love these recalculations. We'll kind of see what happens in here. There we go. Hey, look at that. My addition was even good. So as we look at that, we got we figured out where all of the additions were taking place figured out where we can make a change, made the change, and poof, it appears. So now we have all of our E1s at R6 with a cost of 7,500. This is definitely a good thing as far as our metrics are concerned. So next thing in moving through stuff here. If we look at routes on R7, all right, so let's go over to R7 here and say, do show IP route OSPF. What we're going to find is most of the routes, at least as, as far as other reachability, the internal ones anyway, we should have links at R5 and R6. Right, so go back and look at our diagram. We've got area 567 has two ethernets. So I've got the 150-100-220 network and the 221 network. And I should have a total of four peers on that, two to R5 and two to R6. So we can always go check that with do show IPON. Uh, so that's good right here. If we only wanted to look at the correct things, by the way, we could include fast ethernet, which would, of course, give us just the four of those things right there. But things that I look at, notice that I only have two routes available. One's on fast ethernet 00, one's on fast ethernet 01. Now, if I have four peers all advertising the same route and the same costs, why would I not have four of them? Well, let's check out a route. So, say 102.196. Uh, where is that going to come from? Well, let's let's pick one. Uh, let's see. Do show IP route OSPF. And what do we have? I think 150.100.12. Let's pick on that one. So the link between R1 and R2. 150.100.12.0. So, oh, yeah, that's going to do that and not tell me everything plus that. Uh, do you show IP route 150.100.12.0? And I've got four different things from there, but I have one preferred path. All right, so traffic share count of one. So let's see. Maybe we can change that instead of include to begin and see how it shows up. Okay, so some of them are going to show up with a total of four paths on there. So interesting question on why I have that information. Why some things have four paths and some things only have two of them. Well, when we took a look at the routes that did have two paths, all right, so the different things that we had going on. So let's see. Uh, we can include fast on there, so that way we only get those things going that way. So some routes have four paths to it, where the cost is the same. Other routes only have two paths to it. So why would the cost be different for some of them? Well, those in the end, the 102 networks, are things that are actually coming over from R9. So realistically, the path would be better coming from R9 as opposed to going up the frame relay, coming back down a serial link or whatever through R5. So that's going to be part of the issue right there. Now, what we might want to see, so on areas or links that we do have four of them, uh, so that 209 network, any of the E2 routes that we're going to have should have four paths. Um, any of the 150.100.12 network is going to have four paths to it. So anything where we have the four paths in there, uh, or well, apparently we lost a couple right there, but anyway, whatever those things are that have four paths in them, we're going to want to change things around a little bit. So I want to have a preferred path out for certain routes. 
So when we go about doing this, our lab might tell us that instead of having the multiple paths always show up, what I want to do is create my own hierarchy there. I want to have paths where, say, um, I'm going to use R5 fast Ethernet 01, so that 150.100.221.5 as the first preferred path, R6 FA00 as a second preferred path, then back to R5 FA00, then back to R6 FA01. So when we start looking at this, because keep in mind that all of the stuff that we have on there is going to be, well, very similar in an aspect to how we're going to pick one thing over another. So when I start looking at the different paths to take, this is going to become very important to us. Now, when I start to look at it, so what kinds of things that we have going on here? So we'll go ahead and pick on R7, and we'll go to, you know, one of my links. So say, well, I guess we said FA01 was the first part in there. IPOSPF, question mark. Now, what do I have available to me here? Well, authentication, we're not going to go through. Cost. All right, so cost is going to be part of it. Um, other things that we have, dead interval, demand circuit, flood reduction, all that stuff, nothing else really has any information that I care about one way or the other. So looking at the cost factor, all right, well, I can specify a cost for the link. Now, this is going to be an additive behavior. All right, so that's going to be one different piece that we have involved in there. So let's see, IPOSPF cost, and, and we'll give it... Uh, what well, we want FA01 to be preferred. Well, let's actually look at what our cost is right now. POSPF interface include is up type cost. So, okay. So when we start going through here, FA01 and FA00 both have a cost of 100 as far as my auto calculation goes. So if FA00 I want to be my less preferred path then what I want to do is make sure that my cost to FA01 is better or less. So IP OSPF cost 99. Yeah. So we can do that part there. Now, let's kind of see what happens. Let's do do show IP route uh, 150.112.0. Well, I'm still going to have two paths listed there, and I actually still prefer R6 first for it. Now, why out of this? Because I've got the route metric being the same. So why out of this do I actually prefer R6 over R5? Well, plain and simple, the router ID is higher. So whenever I've got equal cause paths like that, the preferred path will be to the highest router ID. Hmm. So, I mean, short of playing with router IDs, which might go and mess up some of the stuff that we did with our designated routers before, is there anything that we can do to influence which of these two particular things that I'm taking a look at right there? And that's going to be kind of the hard part to play around with. Let's take some looks at things. Let's see. Let's go ahead and scroll this off so we can look at other things as we go. So the next hard part is going to be trying to figure out any sort of preference of R5 to R6. So like we said, OSPF chooses this for us based on the highest router ID value. So R6 is always going to win that information. Now we picked FA01, so that part's perfectly cool on there, but R5 over R6. Now when we start looking at things, so in my router OSPF, I got a couple different things that we can look at. So let's see, going down the differences there, well default metrics only for worrying about stuff that I'm bringing in redistribution, so that doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, max metric, so set maximum metric might be something to take a look at for stuff. Yeah, of course MPLS and all that fun stuff won't be anything in there. Now if we look at the max metric command, Oh, router LSA. Now we do have some options. So we can set the maximum metric router LSA and hit enter. Now, what this will do is, well, kind of sort of exactly what we want in that it will make R6 the least preferred path 
by basically setting the metric to its type 1 LSAs as being the maximum, 65535. Now, in addition, however, what it will do is it will kill any virtual links because the virtual links will not be able to form over a link with a cost that high. So that's going to be part of the issue that we have. So that doesn't exactly do me any good for giving myself reachability still. That means that if R5 disappears, we're pretty well screwed for anything beyond R7. So we don't want to do that. Now, here's an interesting thing to think about, kind of at the bottom of that list, of that traffic share command. How to compute traffic share over alternate paths. This is really what I have now, is I have alternate paths and R5 and R6 together. Traffic share, min, across, enter. So it's going to allow me to use multiple paths or multiple interfaces for equal cost paths. What about multiple routers along equal cost paths? So do show IP route 150, 100.12.0. And I'm still going to show R6 at that point if that does anything changes along the way. Bottom line for C, what we can do, show IP route OSPF. Let's kind of show it this way. And now everything showing up is just FA01 there. So that's not going to help me in terms of my balancing at all. It'll help me balance if I have equal cost paths, but not between equal devices. In all honesty, there's nothing else that we can do about it short of changing router IDs in there. Now, the router IDs that we went to look at before, okay, so now that this is a while back in the lab, the reason we did it is we wanted to make sure that R2 was going to be the hub that, or, or going to be the de designated router by having the highest router ID. So real quick, let's go look at things on here. So R6, let's see, do show... IP OSPF include ID. All right, 223, 255, 255, 255. All right, do show IP OSPF include ID. Right, and on R2, do show IP OSPF include ID. Now, okay, so interesting idea here. We have 224.001. At R2, which is the highest one. That's perfectly cool. I get 233, 255, 255 on R6. Okay, also perfectly cool. So, what if I go in to router 5 now? And say router OSPF1, router ID 224.0.0.0, which, believe it or not, is right there in the middle of it. So let's do a save on this. Clear up USPF process may or may not work for us, but let's yeah, let's go ahead and reload. As I recall, um, let's see, R2 is the DR, so I'm not going to worry too much about that portion. So we should be able to clear this one just fine. All right. So cleared everything off. Got that. All sorts of fun things. By the way, since we changed the router ID, we will need to go to R7 and re-reference that router ID there. Okay, so anything referencing a router ID, do show run in oop, section OSPF. And it appears we just got one virtual link, so that's perfectly cool. But anything referencing a router ID would need to change. So we didn't do any distance commands or anything fun like that, so we don't have to worry about it. But just that virtual link on R7 will now need to reflect 224.0.0.0. So let's see. Do you show IP OSPF include ID? And okay, so we got the right router ID now. So this is cool. So let's go over to R7. Yeah, okay, so I was going to be complaining about that. Do you show run section OSPF. Okay, so we're going to copy this one right here. Copy, go to our notepad window, paste that in, 
say no. Four zero zero zero. See if we can make these messages go away. Oh, yeah, it doesn't like our stuff already being done there. Oh, no, didn't like us taking it out. Yeah, the message digest key portion it doesn't like when we're moving a virtual link, so we'll just remove it that way. So do show run section OSPF. Should have one virtual link in there, 224000. Okay, so cool. Do show IP OSPF neighbors. Make sure I've got two of them over virtual links, which I do. So I should be good on that. So do show IP route 150.100.12.0. And it's still showing R6 there. Now, I'm learning both pieces of information injected into the area from 224.001. So R2 is who's bringing it in there. So that's cool. But I'm getting it from 150.100.221.6. So my peer ID is the next thing being looked at there. Hmm. This gives us all sorts of fun, well, implications anyway, but fun things to take a look at and play around with. So, on a particular interface, the rules are going to be that I have, well, one path and one path only to go with. Now, notice what I'm getting as my route metrics in there. So, realistically, Router ID is not helping me any. Now, it was good that we found a way to play with that, not breaking any other rules that we had. So that was a nice part. But it's not helping me in terms of what we've learned right here. So realistically, let's go back and look at our diagram. The routes on R5 and R6 are being learned over the frame relay network someplace along the way there. I guess from R5, they could also come down that serial link there. But the whole idea being that somehow I need to make that serial 010 on R6 be higher. So if I want to look at doing that, because that will adjust the metrics that R6 has, really shouldn't make that big of a deal. I guess as long as I don't make it too high, all I have to do is offset it by 1, and since the Ethernet link is going to be a cost of 100, I don't need to worry about it going through the Ethernet to get to R5 to go over or anything along those lines. So, serial 010 on R6. Let's go take a look at that and see if this makes the difference. All right, we're going down R7. Here's R6. So do show IPOSPF interface. Uh, serial. Zero, one, zero. All right, so what we have on here, since it's a 1.5 meg line, cost is 64.76. So, change the cost to 64.77. Now, let's go down to R7. I only have one path. All right, so now here's the next tricky question for you. If I lose my connection to R5, let's see, let's go to interface FE01 and shut that down. Okay, so perfectly cool there. So on R7 at this point, I guess we might have to wait 40 seconds, but let's see what happens when we lose that traffic there, lose that path over to R5. Okay, so there we go. So we lost that connection FA01. Oops, so now what does my route show? Well, now it shows I've got two different things. Now I've got it where it's going over R5, fast Ethernet 00, zero but I have two paths. Why do we have two paths on here? Oh yeah, we did that traffic share thing. 
let's see where we have that traffic share command there we go no traffic share if that makes a difference and maybe give it a minute or so to go away That's actually still not going to make a difference there. So now we have two equal cost paths again. So, so let's see. If what we wanted to do was go from R5 FA01 to R6 FA00 next. No, originally we wanted to do FA01, then FA00. Okay. So, what we need to do is change FA01. So, we only did a difference of one, I believe. So, do show run interface FA01. Okay, so the FUSP have cost of 99. Okay. So, if we change this now. 98. So we already fixed the part by adding 1 to R6's stuff. So if I change it to FA01 with the cost of 98, so I'm 2 off, I should no longer have an equal cost path. Or at least in a minute or so, I won't. Okay, so that part worked. So we were R5 to begin with, then we went to R6. So now if we go to R6 and say interface FA01, shut. Sometime within 40 seconds, we should see things go down over here on R7. Okay, so we see the link go down, our dead timer expired there. So now what do we see for a route? All right, we got one path again, so R5, FA00. This is good. And really what that means is that we, even without testing it out, we should go back to R600 because of the cost. So interesting things, and this is one of those things that, you know, as we start looking at it here, definitely a big pain in the butt stepping through all of the ways that we learn about routes and all of the methods that we go about sharing that information can help us decide where to add or where to subtract to get exactly what we want to do. All right, so let's go ahead and go back and do no shut here and do a no shut there and things will actually go back to normal but we should get one path back to R7 anyway as soon as we bring everything up and renegotiate our traffic at that point. So we should end up seeing, um, still seeing our path go to R5, but we should see it via fast ethernet 01 uh, instead of F FA00. So those are going to be our differences in there as far as where we're getting through stuff. Uh, but all in all, changing metrics, step through it one hop at a time, Take a look at what path everything goes, where it goes, how it goes, and think about all the areas that you might change it at. Good part is the changes take place, well, not always immediately, which would be nice, but relatively quickly. It's the SPF calculation. So always good to go back and verify what's going on so that we can see pretty much right away, just like we did with this last one here, and step ourselves through, okay, that didn't work. So let me go back and try something different. That didn't work. Let me go back and try something different until we find the exact answer that we need to step through. Here's the preferred interface. Here's the preferred path for each one and go through them one by one by one. But otherwise, that's the metrics. Okay, so a couple of little side note things or sidebar things going on here. We have a few, well, I guess oddball things to start discussing as far as OSPF goes. Basically, first one is, can you have an OSPF area that happens to not be area zero and actually have everything be fully functional? So we've got a network set up here and just a, you know, a few different routes and whatnot. 
um, kind of give us some ways to go or things to be setting up as far as OSPF, but we want everything to be in Area 678. So we're actually going to put together really kind of a very basic layout for things. I want to go ahead and set stuff up, kind of keep Notepad, make our life a little bit easier in there. But on R6, R7, and R8, we can really just keep things fairly simple and say router OSPF1 and network all zeros area 678. And then we'll do some passive interfaces just to kind of keep things a little bit sane in there. But set things up as far as R8 and R7 goes. See, R7 needs to talk to everybody. R8 does not need to talk with anybody else. So we can do it that way as well. We can do a passive interface default and then no passive for the serial interface, which is the only one we're going to have peers out of. Okay? So there's our very basic idea of just quick and easy setting up OSPF. So let's kind of copy that information there, go over to R6, and paste that. Yeah, okay, so we shouldn't paste R6 in there. It doesn't like that part. Seven paste that, and R8, paste that. And basically, wait and see here, as soon as our peers come up, we should start to see some routes. So, do show IP route OSPF. Well, okay, so in the very beginning, we're not going to get anything. Yeah, we got to kind of wait for everybody. Well, yeah, we're probably got our Ethernets are not going to be the fastest things going on here. So, let's take a look at that. Yep. R7 only has one neighbor, so of course we're not going to be exchanging much information at this point in time. So let's see what we have going on in there. So we just saw our Ethernet links come up at this point in time, so now let's go take a look and see what sort of information that we have. Alright, so pretty much we have access now, it appears, to all of the other links in our network. So let's see what we have. Let's build just a quick Tickle script just for fun in here. So going back to our diagram and taking a look at this, we have a bunch of different IP addresses that we're going to see. So 200, 666, 100.67.0.6, and 7. Same thing here with one in that octet, 200.777, the serial link, and those addresses. That should give us an idea of what kinds of things we're going to see. Actually, we might have a loop back on R8, too. Check that one out. And yes, we have a loop back on R8 too. All right, so a couple different things that we have going on in here. So 200.888, and in our tickle shell for each IP, that stuff. End that ping dollar sign IP source loopback zero repeat three and whatever other options you feel like putting in on there. So kind of quick and easy stuff, and let's go back to here and TCLSH and paste. Eh, it's not liking something I typed in. What did it not like? Well, 4-H is one word. Yeah, it's those small things. So let's try that again. See, this is good because if nothing else now on videotape, you do have proof that I do indeed make mistakes every now and then. 
And I try not to make the same ones twice. So that's always kind of a, a fun thing. But there we go. We have good stuff. We have exclamation points for everything. Excellent. So ECL quit. Go back to config mode. Let's try it on R7 just to make sure we're not going insane here. Paste it. And scroll back up. We see, yep, immediate and good results for everybody. TCL quit. Oops, not exit. Big. And do the same thing on R6. And that appears to be good stuff up there. Yep, successes for everything. So, what we've seen as far as taking a look at our OSPF is a show IP OSPF database where the only thing I have available is area 678 at this point. So yes, we can have a fully functional network in OSPF regardless of whether or not there's an area zero. Kind of cool things. So since we've tested full reachability on a network without area zero, so that was our last one here, a single area running area 678 in there. Now we want to change things around a little bit. So I want to have area 67 and area 78 be separate areas on here and see what kind of reachability we do or do not have at this point. So let's kind of take a look at our things. And we'll go ahead and keep our, our tickle script up there at this point. But we're going to actually separate things out. So easy enough on our 6 to do a no router OSPF1 and just in case there's anything left over let's go ahead and do a new routing instance to begin with now from our sixes standpoint it's really just going to be the same so we can do a network 0000, 000, 000 area 67 passive loopback 0 and keep that on our 7 no router OSPF1. Put the second process in there. And we're going to start to put our different networks into certain areas at this point. So let's see. We've got two interfaces there. The question, of course, becomes what we want to do with the loopback. And we'll kind of see about that. So network. Whoa. Fall asleep on a key. Okay, my keyboard is possessing itself. That's always a nice thing for this time of night. Try this again. Apparently it didn't like talking about that stuff. So let's see, network 167, 0.0.0.1.255, area 67. Yeah, let's we'll go ahead and put that in area 78. All right, we'll do that. And then R8, no router OSPF1, router OSPF2, and we can do the same thing here like we did on R6 which is the net with quad zeros in area 78, passive default again, and no passive serial zero, zero, zero. All right, so let's see what we get as far as our different routers go. So there's our eights information. Paste that in. Sixes information, paste that in, and of course, our sevens information, paste that in. So we should see at this point in time, or start to see at this point in time, certain things going on there. Now, 
from where we're going here, the serial link has come back up, so that's at least a good place to start on things. And I can go over to R8, do show IP route, OSPF, and I at least have that loop back there. Okay, so that's a good part. Now, still up to this point in time, oh, no, 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 okay, those are the ones going down. Up to this point in time, we haven't seen anything out of our fast Ethernet links yet. So until those come up and start to really exchange routing information, there's not a heck of a lot that I can do about it. Yeah, yeah, you know, we got to sit and wait a little bit for all the elections to be done. And, okay, there we go. So it appears we have our fast Ethernets now. So R6, do show IP route to OSPF. And we got nothing there. Okay. Do show IP route to OSPF. And I got a couple different things going on there. So pretty much each of my different links. And do show IP route to OSPF. So what we're seeing, or what we appear to be seeing here, is that there is no exchange between the two OSPF areas. Right. So good to be able to prove this stuff somehow, especially since you can have one area that's not area zero. You can't have two areas that are not area zero and actually expect them to communicate. You can't do any redistribution or other fun stuff amongst yourselves either. The only way we're going to be able to exchange routes is to actually create an area zero. So we can go up to R7 right now. And, well, I mean, just for simplicity's sake, if we're not going to be adding any new um, interfaces in or doing anything like that, we can simply change the loopback. So network 200.777 reflag it as area zero okay. and it'll tell us so it gives us this nice little informational message here that is changing from area 78 to area zero now at this point in time now I suddenly have full reachability okay. so we haven't really changed anything we haven't affected our peers at all but magically everything is going to start working the way that I would expect it to so let's go ahead and go out into the tickle shell at this point and go back and see if I can get that information to paste in because it worked before when we were a single area so let's see if it uh, works now in our multi area and it appears to from R8 so this is a good thing and test it out from R6 Paste it in there, and it all looks like it was good as well. So expected behavior, or at least uh, hopefully anticipated behavior. So everything that you want in there, as soon as you create an area zero, it will all go through. Now, you do have to have area zero on a real interface. Uh, if I were going to try to do a virtual link, which of course is an area zero interface, the virtual link would always show as down until I had an area zero existing to begin with. Now, an interesting little trick, and we've seen it on a couple practice labs in the past from various places. You can create a loopback in area zero. You can then create your virtual link, which will of course come up at that point in time. If you remove that loopback from area zero, your virtual link will still stay up as long as you don't reset your process or reset your routers. As soon as you do that, it's not going to come back. So interesting little tricky behavior as you start going through things, but that's kind of the gist of stuff to watch out for. Bottom line, more than one area, you must have area zero. And by the way, in case you care, it's actually spelled out very nicely in the RFC that all LSAs must go through area zero, so it's kind of hard to exist without one. But just in case you're trying to push that limit, you do have uh, possibilities in there. We don't have to have a peer in Area 0. So as you see with our loopback right here, I have nobody else that I'm talking to in Area 0. But from a database perspective, Area 0 does exist. And that's the important part. So that's our gist for our area stuff. So other interesting things, or last little bit, I guess, of interesting things that we can do with OSPF and our area designations. So let's take a look at our multi-area design right here. We just got finished kind of doing that and looking at stuff with or without area zero existing. And let's change things around. 
So say you were given this on a starting diagram. So you might have configs already in your router. OSPF is working perfectly cool, exchanging routes, but we want to change things a little bit. So first thing I want to do is I'm told to make area 67 into area 6700. And then area 78 into area 7800. So in and of itself, that seems like a, you know, fairly straightforward thing to do. It's like, all right, we can we can deal with that. So take a look at, uh, you know, probably a good thing to start with would be show um, run section OSPF. And see what we got for each of those. Okay, so pretty simple in there. Router OSPF 1. And we'll just do a copy paste for this. And put the different area numbers on there. All right, that's pretty simple. Now, of course, we should drop our peering arrangement momentarily here. Okay, oops. Yeah, I kind of forgot about that. No router OSPF 1. Router OSPF 2. And put that command in. Now we should start to see the neighbors go down. Yeah. Too many changes, not nearly enough caffeine. Kind of keep that in mind for your lab. So R8, do the same type of thing, preferably typing the correct OSPF instance to begin with. But as we go through here, so router OSPF 2... I'm in trouble with my mouse this morning. Copy and paste. Add two zeros on that. So changing R6 and R8 is no big deal. Okay. Now, so let's kind of go forward before we change on R7 and say that there's another requirement that we have. So R7 is not allowed to reference area 6700 or area 7800 any place in the configuration. So now if it just said can't use it with a network command, well, we can cheat. We can go to the interfaces and type IPOSPF to uh, area 7800 or 6700. Okay, so there's an interface command instead of the network command that we can do. But either way, that involves typing area 6700 or area 7800. So if we're not allowed to type those commands in, now this might be difficult way to get through things because it involves binary and we all know how much pe most people love binary so as we start looking at this what you have to think of is that an area ID according to the RFC an area ID is simply a 32-bit number now typically in the Cisco world this is designated as a decimal number so anything between 0 and 4.2 billion perfectly cool in other vendors' designs, and also in Cisco if you want to, you can use dotted decimal format. So dotted decimal format makes things a little bit more difficult. So it's not like you're going to put 67.00, because that really wouldn't make any sense in there. But what we can do is take 6700 and convert it into binary. I know, it's going to kind of make your brain hurt. But on the flip side, this is why we have Windows Calculator available on the lab exam. Now, of course, normal view is not going to help you very much, so go into scientific view. So let's say 6700 and convert that to binary. Now, what do we have? We got 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, let's just paste this in Word. Edit, copy. Here's notepad and paste. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So now we have it in a dotted decimal format. So what we're going to be looking at in here is simply converting it back. So take this, copy it, go back over here, and Paste it in as a decimal. Okay, so I got 26 dot. Oh, take this one, 
copy it, go back to binary, paste it, and decimal, and 44. Okay. So this is going to be the equivalent of 6700, where we started. So, honestly, we've got to give it all of them, so it'd be 0 0.0, 2644. But this gives us a way to look at things on here. So, since we go, and we'll test this out just to kind of, you know, watch everything, let's go over to R7, do show run, section OSPF. And take a look at that. All right, do show IP OSPF neighbors, which, of course, we have none right now. So, things for 67. So let's go into router OSPF2 and say network 100.67.0.0.0.0.1.255 area. And what did we say that it was? A 0.0.26.44. And try that. And take a look at that. We just peered perfectly fine with those routers. So let's go do the same thing for 7800 now. And right, so I'll start out with 7800. And where do Windows Calculator go? Decimal, 7800. Binary, copy, paste, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. So paste this back in. Decimal, that'll be 30 dot. Copy that one. Back to binary. Paste decimal, whoop, decimal 120. So 30.120 is going to be area 7800. Oh, or zero, zero. Okay, so back over here, network 222, 222, 223.7, 0000, 000 area. Oh, where are we at? Paste. And magic happens. So let's see and make sure that we have all of our routing information here. And it appears that I have full reachability at this point. So let's take a look at our output. Show IPSPF database on here. I'm going to have area 7800. That's the only reference that I have. Show IPSPF database over here. Area 6700. And on R7, I'm going to have, well, Area 0, because we're going to start there, and notice that everything else is referenced in that dotted decimal format. Right? So it is simply a, well, it's a state of mind, but that's it. That's all that it is, is that simple state of mind there. There's no difference from the binary perspective as far as your routers are concerned. So whether you reference it in dotted decimal or whether you reference it in a decimal number makes zero bit of difference to your router. So keep in mind that area 0.0.0.0, .0 is the same thing as area 0. Area 0 .0 0.0.1.1 .1 is not the same as area 1, okay? or 1.1.1.1 for that matter. It's not the same as area 1. So when we start looking at that, it's going to be very important to think through those different things on there. So it's going to give you an example for it. Let's see in binary. Clear that out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that would be 1.1.1.1 1 .1 .1 .1 written fully out in binary. Decimal, of course. Yeah. So, uh, what, area 16.8 million. I'm kind of thinking that's not going to be the same as area 1. So, watch what your lab calls for, but just be aware of those functional differences from dotted decimal versus decimal notation. 
but they all work perfectly fine. And you can even mix and match, by the way. Now, some things as a decimal number, some things as a dotted decimal number, and it still works perfectly cool because the binary is all equal. All right. So otherwise, that's it for the OSPF stuff.